today we have a special guest, Kevin Lang. Thank you so much, mate. Oh, uh, thank you, Paul. Author of Fitted Up. You see his books here. Absolute diamond geezer. Um, let us in your house today. I really appreciate it. Very warming. Thank you very much. So, mate. Thank you. It's nice for you to travel all the way from Ipswich to come see me. No, um, it's, uh, it's that work traffic, isn't it? Yes. It's that work traffic. Normally, we, we, we'll, we'll get up really super early, so we miss all this work traffic, traveling in the dark, go home in the dark, you know, but yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah we hit all the traffic on the way over here. I know how you feel. I'm out the door between five and six every morning. We're normally about half five, sometimes earlier. Out the door every morning. Crack, bosh, up and out. Yeah. Try to miss the traffic. So, uh, fit it up and fighting back. Fit it up and fighting back. So this is your uh, first interview since you've been out? I've the second one. Second one. Okay, but uh, yeah, you're going to get material that uh, isn't out there. So it's live and it's raw with you. Um, obviously, I was recalled mm -hmm. prison. So I got recalled based on the conviction for contract killing. I've had that hanging over my head or around my neck, should I say, like a noose that people can tighten whenever they want. Because mm -hmm. um, you're always on, you, you're, you're walking a fine line. So you get somebody who can report you for something that you haven't yeah, done. Yeah, you're always under the watch for lie, I guess. You're never ever from it. So anything that you can say could cost you your liberty in any, oh. any place whatsoever. How, how does that make you feel? You're just treading on eggshells at times, so you can have people... If I'm in the car, for instance, and I'm driving down the road, and you get people who've got road rage, for whatever reason, some people just kick off for no reason, they? they get out of the car and they start. They come up to the car to start punching the windows. It's kids in the back of the car. Or you've got your girlfriend in the car, whoever. You could have my auntie June, who's 90, sitting in the passenger seat. You can just sit in the car and they keep punching the window screen or punching the windows. What would you do? I would get out. I've got, I think 99% 90, of people would get out. I would get out. I'd get out before they got to the bleeding car mm -hmm. because you know they're hell-bent on either damaging your vehicle or I'd get out to try and sell them. Mate, what's the matter? What's yeah. all this about? You're like, Calm but down. even that, even that, like you getting out and, and it, because you've got out of the vehicle, you've, you've lined yourself up there straight away. You're lined up if you don't do nothing and you've lined up if you do. So then, say for instance, we are talking this scenario here, they fire punch you, you say, mate, you give them a bang, they fall over, you've assaulted them. Mm -hmm. No self-defence. But until that self-defence has been resolved through the uh, criminal justice system, you will go on remand. So you'll get pulled back into prison until, until the court case is sorted out. Until the court sorted. case is sorted out. So, um, Scary times, man. I mean, I served 20 years in prison for a crime I didn't commit. So, first of all, you've served a very unjustful sentence and you've been held at the highest grade that criminal justice can throw at you and I was held at what's called triple category A so most people know what cat A is yeah uh, cat A was brought in for the IRA and it was brought in for serious gun crime or drug cases back many years ago mm -hmm. and then of course the way society's evolved there's so many kids now with guns and there's so many people drug dealing the landings are full up they can't make everybody cut A. Mm. So now you've got people in B category systems doing 30 years or 40 years sometimes in a B cat. They would never been in there yeah. in those years ago. So cut A is what people really recognise. Then you've got double A, which is high risk, and then you get exceptional risk, which is triple A. So I was held at high risk and then triple A. I was upgraded to triple A. And I was the only man in this country held at triple category A whilst on remand. I'd say back... To 25 years ago when, um, I don't say this in an insulting manner to criminals of today, but of it's where people were committing crime and they were putting a bit of work into a bit of crime. Mm -hmm. So the Hatton Garden, Kenny Collins, dear friend of mine, is in my book. I speak to him all the time, you know, visit him when he's allowed. Um, it took, you know, if I say two years, it's just under that to plan that bit of work. Yeah. Year and a bit, you know, and they plan it. Now, that's all gone. So, years ago, the old school criminals around the landings, uh, you'd get a K, but now there's everybody. So, I was in the unit with the likes of Kenny and various other people in uh, the criminal fraternity in England that you see in the papers a lot and families and names of people or crimes that you'd read about in the papers. 
it was a shock to me. So I was on the mind for that murder, held it like a grade, wrongfully, couldn't touch no one. And I've described it in the past as like a, 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 a war, an escape camp with all lights and helicopters and barbed yeah. wire and dogs going around it and all, you know, big, big bleeding floodlights and torches, you know, on the bleeding German war camp, prisoner camp thing, you know, mm -hmm. you see it in films, didn't you? Yeah. And that's what it was like. So I got convicted for that murder wrongfully convicted and I was at two trials I'd hung jury the first trial second trial I was convicted again by a 10 to 2 majority what was the time gap between the two trials uh, November to March and the reason they brought it forward so quick well I feel it was quick was because the prosecutor he had cancer had a tumour in the brain or something mm. like that and he, and he died he died a month, less than a month after I was convicted wow. so that allowed him to bend the rules and say things he shouldn't have said during the trial. Yeah. Um, but he's dead now, so I'm not going to labour on about him no more. He did his job. Uh, no doubt he's probably a decent old chap. He just wanted the conviction. And he got it. Um, which that brings me to... So I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a little while. So I was in the unit going to court with armed police. Mm -hmm. Helicopter above the van going down roads that were shut off, going around roundabouts the wrong way, armed police everywhere. Full on then. So they, they, they really, um, what, did they just think he was going to escape or something? Well, they said, like, um, I'll tell you it all came about. So this gentleman here, can you see that? Can you put that up to the camera, please? Let's have a look at that gentleman's face. Is that, is that all right there, Jay? That's it. So that gentleman there is, is a fellow called Roger Vincent. He got arrested for my murder. And when he got arrested for my murder, he began, he engaged in a number of confidential chats. So again, this is Roger Vincent's custody record. And could you just hold that up again, Paul, please? Sorry, I won't keep, and just to, so you can see, hold it there for a little while, and you can see all of the signatures on there, which is Roger Vincent, and he's, uh, he signed it five times. So this is his custody record. And in his custody records, he begins by saying, a visit from D.S. Spackman. D.S. Spackman was the investigating officer in my case, and he subsequently got convicted for a number of activities some years after my case. But all of the things he did in his own case, he did in mine, and he did in that of another case that was subsequently acquitted. But this is a custody record. So Roger Vince has been arrested for murder with David Smith. And he says, a visit to, from D.S. Spackman to ascertain if wanted to have an informal chat. Vincent confirmed he was happy to have an interview without his solicitor being informed or present. Okay? So then he goes off to the interview room. He then goes off again to the interview room the next day. And he signs that there, by the way, Roger Vincent. He has to sign it on the page. So there's another one. Uh, taken to interview room at his request and spoke regarding sensitive material to D.S. Spackman and D.C. Kennedy. All right? So we've never been given the interviews of those. So I was arrested off the base, basis of these, him, Roger Vincent, being arrested for murder. And he was going around the area telling people he committed the murder, calling himself, him and his mate, Ronnie and Reggie, telling people how they committed Self -proclaimed, it. Self-proclaimed. Huh? Self-proclaimed, yeah. He was seen to be shown off a gun in a pub called the Smuggler's Cove pub, um, where... Uh, a number of things happened in that pub. So th there was a car used in the murder. A gentleman was caught with a car. That's his local pub. It's Vincent's local pub. Uh, he turned around and said, Vincent gave him the car and asked him to dispose of it. Well, I never got that statement until 2007. I was convicted in 1996. So if I'd have got that statement from the gentleman who was caught with a car, saying that Roger Vincent gave it to him and asked him to burn it, I wouldn't be here now. I wouldn't have been here now if... Those confidential chats that Roger Vincent had in the police station, okay, had been disclosed. So, following the charging of Roger Allen Vincent with being concerned in the murder of Robert McGill, I spoke confidentially with Mr Vincent at his request. And these are confidential chats that have been disclosed in the public domain on the 8th of November 1995. 
at the, uh, the old Bailey. And there's references and there's casework details on there. It's all in the book for anybody to see. You can see I haven't made it up and the book's been released now for a year. There's been no orders placed on me or no injunctions by the police or anybody. It's been checked. Well, if it's in the public domain, they can't, they can't get this thrown against you, can they? Because it's public knowledge. Public knowledge. Public knowledge. And I've even got the court record for when the hearing was taken place in relation to disclosing the confidential chats. They were disclosed to Vincent and not me. So, uh, I spoke confidentially with Mr. Vincent at his request. He reaffirmed that he had not been present when McGill was shot and was shocked that he had been charged with the, the, the offence. He wanted to do a deal whereby his charge would be dropped. In return, he said he would supply through a solicitor a statement accounting for his prints being in the car. And he would supply on a confidential basis details of the two persons responsible for the murder. The persons who put them up to it, including how much had was paid. He stated that they had in fact been paid to kill McGill and that they were responsible for another one whereby his blank tail had been killed. From the limited details he gave, it was clearly referred to the murder being investigated in Surrey. So that's two murders he's put me up for. He said that the killers had been paid. He intimated I apologise for that. I should not have mentioned that. I'll bleep uh, that out. Yeah, well. I, haven't, I haven't got their permission to say that, so that has to be blanked out. It's just because I'm not reading. It's not a problem. I'll get that. Thank uh, you. The fam he intimated that a family, including blah, 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 had, had an involvement. He stated that a thorough police investigation would net everyone involved with the exception of someone he referred to as, again, I can't mention that person's name. He's dead now, God rest his soul. But he had nothing to do with this bloody murder who did not get his hands dirty. But that person that Vincent mentions in there, they're both well-known people. So that brought the attention of the police to it even more so, because mm. they would love to have got these people in this prison. He wanted me to think over his offer and said that he could get his solicitor down to the police station on Sunday. There we go. Now that's one of the confidential chats that Roger Vincent had with the police in relation to my conviction, that led to my arrest and my conviction, okay? And that's what I was up against. So I served that sentence. 20 years I served, up and down the country, 18 moves in four years. When I came out of the units, I spent 27 months in the units. So I came out of the special secure units, and it's a prison within a prison. Mm -hmm. And I went on to the mainstream landings. But I found completely different. At the time, like, there was a lot of old school criminals in there, like I say, and opposed to... In 2006, you're getting all the new age coming in. The young guns off the street for killing people for postal codes. There's a big difference, isn't there, between the criminal fraternity of old school and new school. Unbelievable. Um, I, I, I'm sure, like, you living amongst them, you could tell. Um, at, at some point, you might, you guys must have just sat back and been like, what the fuck has happened here? Like, what, what's happened to the criminal fraternity here? I to look around the landings and think, you're spitting on the landing. We live here. What's wrong with you? Mm. Keep it clean for yourself. You're in the kitchen. There'll be a chicken there that's been left defrosted on the side for the blood to run off all over the floor, pick the chicken up, wash it, leave the blood. So you go in and you go, I'd have words with them. I say, what are you doing? Yeah. Clean it up. You know, we live here. You know, we got, what's, you know but in a nice long manner. But, you, you know, you can only be nice so many times to people because... They've got an attitude to start with because they're young and they've got a pebble in their shoe. They're walking like bleeding. Mm -hmm. they, you know, I don't know why it's a matter with the young kids of today robbing each other in their cells for their trainers. You couldn't do that when I was away. Nah. Rob people. You just you had, you had, you had respect for your fellow interns. It's all gone. So we see the changes. And then you end up becoming a bit of a recluse because you don't want to come out onto the landing as so much as you once did because you want to be away from all away from the all, shit yeah. that goes on out there. And it's all bickery and gossipy and they're directing their anger at each other because they're unhappy about being in prison. Mm -hmm. So that has to go somewhere. Instead of just getting on with their life, building a life for themselves within prison, because whilst you're there, you've got to make it the best you can. How did, um, how did you find that this new generation of criminals were... Um looking up to the elders yourselves and, and even people like um, like above you that's been there even longer, you know? How do you find that these new generation criminals were looking up to you guys 
you know, because so because you're old school and the way that it should have been done criminal wise with respect and, and morals between the code between you guys. And when you come across these new youngsters that don't care about any of that stuff, how was you guys looked upon? They don't care about it until you've got a reputation. And if you've got a reputation, well, they know you will come into that cell, whether there's one of them or three of them or four of them or five of them, and stand your ground, yeah. then they respect you. Why is it violence gains respect? Yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I never understood that. It is mental. So you can... Me, I walked around them landings as happy as Larry and as friendly as anybody. And people said, like the star of my reports always said, Lane's good for the landing. He's happy. He's, he's, he, he doesn't like bullies. I did have a lot of moves around the system. I had a lot of problems for. Sound like I won't have a paedophile live on the landing. Yeah. I won't have a rapist on the landing. Yeah, you know? of course. And there have been a couple of fellows who find their injustice and they've been in 15, 16 years and they wouldn't go on the numbers. And people knew of this case because they lived in the area. And that's one fellow who, was, who stayed on the lands. I ever come across it was him for rape and he, he swore and he was standing his ground, right? And I respected him for that, okay? But there was a lot that, would, you know, you know, ain't there's a smell about them or they've robbed women by knife point and they've robbed nine women, two of them have been pregnant. Mm -hmm. For instance, that did happen and I chased the geezer off the, off the wing. So there's a lot of grey areas. So you'd have prison staff, they like it because they don't like these scumbags themselves yeah yeah but um eventually you end up having to realize that you're just never going home if you just don't let these vermin vermin live on the land mm. or come in and convert to islam and unfortunately it's an insult to islam because they come in they take drugs they're drinking they're watching porn they're not respecting the religion, which is a peaceful religion, mm -hmm. but they're, they're converted to Islam to be part of the bigger gang. But they're abusing the religion. So then that was a, that caused a lot of problems because you've got the terrorists coming in who are doing bombing, boiling up fat, melting bottles down, and putting batteries in uh, a pan and anything that would melt, and then putting over people's heads. So then they adopt the same bleeding war tactics. Exactly, yeah. And it's just, it messed the system up because it didn't matter if you was black, white, red, grey, yellow, whatever you was. If you was a good person, you got on with your other mates, people you live with on the landings. The new crew come in, of course they've got beef with you because you live across the road and they've shot your cousin. Yeah. So then they rather than have a good old straightener, boil some fat, get some ghee, sling it in your face. Mm. Nasty places to live around. So it, it, it made the system very, very... Electrifying, like people were looking and, 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 and waiting for the next incident. And I went all through that, and the way I, I tried to get through it was work on my case day and night, every single day. I very rarely had a day off, didn't have a TV for 20 years, and I trained. I was a gym That's good for the brain, not having a TV and focusing on, on this, very good for the brain. Paul, my barrister, Joel Bernay from QC, he says, I was the most well-represented uh, well client he has ever had. And I used to draft my representations up. And you've had a look at some of these earlier. Yeah, have, so yeah. representations to special counsel. And this was in relation to Roger Vincent's confidential chats. So I made my representations in relation to his confidential chats saying that, how can you be charged with murder? And so I'm going to go back a little bit. So um, I spent a lot of time studying getting into the paperwork, and like I, said, I wrote over 10,000 letters. And like I said, I didn't have a TV because I feel it makes the brain go numb because mm -hmm. you're clicking there, click, 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 thinking about outside, mm -hmm. when that's no good. You need to be consumed in something, a book, yeah. excellent book. So I've gone from getting expelled from school. I've always worked. I've always done really well. You know, I've worked for Irish Life, mortgage broker, and stuff like that in the end. I just messed around in school too much, but... Uh, I've got a brain in my head and I've proved that. Yeah. So I've got two businesses now. I'm, you know, having a go. Um, Good. Which I mustn't crum complain about. Um, one of them turned over three and a half million pound uh, and the other one about the same. That was in three years. So that ain't all profit, of course, but uh, they're no longer here now because of bleeding COVID. Oh. So I've had to come back out again and get started again, but that's another matter. So... Um, I studied and just pulled myself away from him. So when I was in the unit, 
Kenny Collins was in there many years ago. Mm -hmm. And he used to have Ralph Himes. Ralph Himes was represented the craze. And he told Kenny that a deal had been done because Roger Vincent also had Ralph Himes. And he said, look, the deal's done. Your pal's going away, Kenny. He said, Vincent's getting out of halfway submissions. Lo and behold it, the judge stopped the trial. Bear in mind, don't forget, Vincent was being kept up and down the prison, in different prisons. And I've got legal documents from his prison record where it says, special visit on freeze landing from police. Police interview went well. And he was seeing different police forces due to the different murders he said that I'd done. So, and obviously he was broken. How many deal murders has he said that you've done? Three that I'm, I've got on record. So, and this, you know, you imagine that from a police force's mm -hmm. perspective. Unsolved murders, high profile murders. Fucking hell, really, what is him? And then they want them, and then he's telling them all sorts of crap. Yeah, they become but, hungry, and their direction is just like they're, oh, blind, they're want, blind to the evidence. They just want that conviction. Tunnel vision, get that conviction. It would be a big bleeding. Pat on the shoulder and on the medal and all the rest of it. So he's had these confidential chats. So years later, when I got them, and Vincent got acquitted, like I said, halfway submission. So I couldn't work it out because if, and I bear in mind, so I didn't know at that time. So if you're in, being charged with murder on a joint uh, conspiracy, joint enterprise, mm -hmm. then you should be asked questions about how come you know so much about the murder? how much was paid, how it happened, who yeah. paid for it, et cetera, et cetera. He would have had to have had some involvement, right, if, he, if this was the case? Paul, it, it was never brought out. He was, like I say, he was going around calling himself Ronnie and Reggie. And I've always said, I wonder which one was Ronnie. <laughs> All right. Like so, that. Like that. Yeah, 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 I think they were both one, to be honest with you. <laughs> no offence to him, but you know, yeah, yeah. you know, so... Um, if they'd have, if they'd have come out with that at the time, I'd have said, "Well, you need to ask my accuser because before they came to me, they went directly to Roger Vincent because he was going around admitted to the murder, showing off a gun, his fingerprints are in the car. He was given a car to the gentleman who burned it and said, "Get rid of it.' He's told another fellow up that he's just killed a person and sold him the gun used in the murder. <laughs> None of this came out. It's disgraceful. So I wrote to special counsel to consider my." Uh, my argument and, my, and, and the merit of my argument because when you go to court of appeal it's on the merit of your argument how strong it is and I was just saying how can that be that the jury was not made aware of all this information as well as supplying the information with mur uh, the police with information about the murder surely it should have been for the jury to decide if he was guilty or not where he couldn't account for the day of his murder till six months after the murder during police interview mm -hmm. he withheld that the, the bank police officer said he didn't find it uh, a priority to find out where he was on the day of the murder. I don't see how the CPS could have let this all slip through this through to the... Uh... It's in the book, and you, you, you read it, it's factual. And I'm not going to tell you on more, more about it, but in the book, I don't want to give you all the details. People have gone, my God, Amazon give it 4.9. John Bolson of Netflix, What Makes a Murderer. Powerful reading. Yeah. And I could go on and on and on. That of celebrities and people that are reading it, journalists, and Duncan Campbell, Julie Christie, Oscar winner, voted top 10 in the wealthy beauty in her days of acting, still a very beautiful lady now. Excellent read, couldn't put it down. And I could go on and on and on and on and on. And it is an excellent book, not because it's my book, but because of the reviews I'm getting. Yeah. And it's all in there for people to read. And people are saying, book clubs, best book we've read all year. Couldn't put it again, read it in one go. So what I did in the prison system was draft all these documents to the Criminal Cases Review Commission. Here's one here for the royal family. So a gentleman called Derek Webb, police officer from Hertfordshire Police. I, I had a BBC investigating my case and I learned about a police officer and some journalists who was arrested who were giving out some facts about various bits and pieces. And I, and I made my investigations and it came about... This gentleman called Derek Webb had a file called The Miscarriage of Justice of Kevin Lane, and he was going to sell it to the newspapers. But whilst he was preparing to do that, he was watching the royal family, and he worked out that the royal family used the same car for each member of the royal family without changing it. So it's a security breach. It doesn't happen now, of course, yeah. 
But as a result of that, he had 35 men in black raid his house and took every single bit of paperwork, book that you could write on and anything else out of that house, as well as the miscarriage of justice of Kevin Mainfile. I, like I say, realised and uh, I found out that that had been done and started writing to everybody in there and their aunt. And I eventually got a letter from Heather Mills from Private Eye magazine. And she said she was during a, uh, a court hearing where the miscarriage of justice of Kevin Lane file came up. And the judge made it public community interest, which means sensitive material. And it will never be disclosed because the MI5 family are entangled with me. Wow. And Derek Webb, the police officer from Hertfordshire Police, says he was present when Spackman told him he wrote and falsified statements naming me for the murder and signed him in the name of David Smith. And a number of other documents and facts are in that file he's aware of. And that was now, it's still never been disclosed. And that came out in open court. And it was, like I say, found out by Heather Mills of Private Eye. Can you imagine if you weren't so hungry for your freedom, how many, how many other people this is, would have happened to that would have had to have sat on it? I've you got know. pals of mine, Pete Rowe too, he's in his 20th year, he's just, he still can't get off the cut, eh? Doing a murder for his co-defendant. Didn't do it. His, murder, his co-defendant did it. He's doing the murder. Can't get off of it. Can't get police texts to the, what, the, the, one of the, the witnesses, uh, the deceased wife, in fact, or girlfriend, he was not sure if he was married or not. The police officer was investigating the case, and he's married to her now, but he was sending messages about the case. My friend Peter O'Toole cannot get access to those messages. Wow. And imagine if they were to be disclosed, mm. uh, and it says that he was giving her information. He can't get them. So there's people like Peter O'Toole who's suffering those injustices right way through the system. Mm -hmm. So if it wasn't for me writing all these letters over the years, and like I say, I'd, I'd sometimes do 20 letters in one day, or change the introduction, or change the address, or, uh, you know, sometimes you might do a lot of journalists in one go, so you've just got to reproduce a letter. And I would do so. So you send 20 letters out, recorded delivery, in one go, out there. And that comes to money. So I used to have 100 first class and second class stamps in a month and 50 first class large. And I would send documents out, pay them for it out of my private cash. Documents as large as this file. Imagine that, going out in the post. Like Morgan Freeman, he had a, a, a jazz bar in Mississippi. I forget what it's called. I sent him one. So they used to call me Mr. Shawshank. They wrote so many letters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So... I sent him one. I think it cost me £33 to send it to him. And I'd, I'd send out many of these. It'd go from A to Z. It'd give you an introduction about the case, news articles by The Guardian, The Observer. Did you get much back? Loads. It took me seven years, though, before I started seeing BBC uh, news bulletins and articles in the paper and such like that. But then, of course, 100 letters. I get one reply. That's a step forward. Yeah. My trainer, John Scott from Bushy ABC, used to say... For 100 punches, Kevin, if 99 miss, it's the one that lands that you want. I thought, I don't have missed 99 times, John. Yeah, so I've had a good yeah. iron in that ring, but I get your chronology. Yeah. yeah. So I used to think, right, 100 letters, get the letters out, get the letters out, get the letters out. And it worked. So in 2011, some documents were sent to my solicitor from an anonymous source, but they came out in the police files. Oh. So as a result, I got downgraded. And the prison director was waiting outside my cell, like Jim Morley in Franklin at the time. And he came back. And I liked Danny. He was a big, uh, a big fan, a big Scotsman. And he'd say that as it was. I got away of him. You know, he can't, uh, inmates can't always get on with people, but I found him a man's man for me. And one of my fucking best pals, he never got on with him. Mm. And, he, and uh, he, for different reasons, but I got on with him. And he, he asked me about the documents. And I said, yeah, it's correct. He said, well, I've come to tell you I've put something in place in relation to Category 8. Bang! I was out the bleeding door. Blink Free. of an eye, gone straight into BCAT system. Sitting in the governor's office, they said, you've been downgraded. Uh, Kath told me, a woman's screw, real nice lady, told me I'd been downgraded to a BCAT. She wouldn't talk to you if there was a smell about you. Yeah. You know, she'd do her job. Yeah. She, was, she was just up north, bringing in a waste for the family. And thank God for the good in the job, eh, Paul? Yeah. There'd be terrible places otherwise, wouldn't they? Mm, and, uh, you know, and people want to remember that. So like Phil Prout, for instance, I'll talk about him in a minute, but they downgraded me. Uh, where do you want to go? Rye Hill, I said, private prison, bang, straight in there. 
I went B, C, D, out the door. And my appeal for that paperwork didn't come to light until I got out of the prison. Oh, wow. So I was released. All right? So they dragged their wheels. There was an investigation ordered by the Court of Appeal to the CCRC. The CCRC instructed the police force that convicted me to, to investigate themselves. The coppers that was investigating their com colleagues went into the files where this paper was meant to come from. 20 days after going into the files, they went back to the, C the, the uh, CPS and the Court of Appeal and said, oh, there's a conflict of interest. We know the police officer involved in this case. By which time, they'd been into the files, haven't they? Yeah. Yeah, they've already looked into it already, so they're sitting there saying... Yeah, who knows? But the paperwork's not about no more. They're gone, yeah? There we go. Why did they take 20 days to make that decision? And I've got all the letters confirming all of that. So that's what you're up against. So I then go up on appeal. And I had Lord Chief Justice Hughes at the time sitting on my case. He stepped out two weeks before the court case and Lord Chief Justice Rafferty stepped in. Well, Rafferty was sitting at the bedside of my prosecutor, Mr. Callisher, when he died in his hospice, or as he was dying, you know, during his yeah. lead up to that. And they decided to set up what's called the Callisher Trust. The Callisher Trust was to fund training barristers during their, uh, obviously, their training. And where do you think they worked? The Criminal Cases Review Commission. My case has been to them three times. So, and it was set up immediately. So my applications to the, the CCRC, or the Criminal Cases Review Commission, are going before people who's having their, their training or their, their, to become a barrister. Being funded by Funded them, by yeah. their nemesis, Kalisha. Yeah. So then she steps into my appeal and knocks me back. Oh. She should never have sat on that appeal. It's a conflict of interest. Yeah. And that's what happened there. And there's more to come, which is in the book and stuff like that. So, But it kept me busy. And eventually I got released and went straight to work, built up a company. What was it like being released back into? Because, you know, like in prison, they say that um, time stops, but outside it doesn't. So when you go in, everything is like, how you think it is and you you do to come out and then the world is just so different and it does change so fast the outside world it changes so fast like technology everything else you know um, and the fact that you'd gone in um you know no tv so you'd kept yourself away from all of the the modern amenities of of how people survive their daily their daily routines with TV and stuff, and you've focused on, on paperwork. So when you come out, how did that, how did that make you feel? Well, when I went to Royal, they had Freeview. And I'd never heard of Babe Station. Yeah. And I'd never seen that on TV. <laughs> <laughs> you switch it on. <laughs> it used to, be, used to be the size of that book in a cassette. <laughs> in the old VHS. <laughs> yeah, bloody mind bog, and I thought, oh, well, things have moved on. Yeah, and then um, lots of big cars. You know, you, you, no rusty cars no more. Mm. Uh, and the the, the the culture had changed. We had Polish shops, and for for the industry that was required, their you know their skills, mm -hmm. and Romanians, and there's a lot of foreign people in the country from different countries, which you know it. it uh, you it would have been the amongst them inside, though, wouldn't you? Not as much. I started seeing an influx when the borders were open because of the guns and the drugs mm. and such that were coming in from other countries, being driven through the borders and getting the king's ransom for it from where they come from, mm -hmm. going back and buying a house for a boot full of guns. And you wonder why there's so much gun and drug and tr human trafficking in this country now because we've got millions of people that are here now after the working uh, culture came into this country mm -hmm. from Poland or Romania or wherever. But with that, they've settled and, I mean, it's just, it's flooded. And I'm, I'm sure many viewers would agree with me. And that, that, whether you're Polish, good luck to you, you know, it's good and bad. But as a result of opening our borders, we let in people that we didn't want here. Mm -hmm. And now you see it on the, on the landings. Loads of different cultures for different reasons and they're in for the crimes that I would rather they committed in their own country. Yeah. Because uh, we've got enough people committing those crimes in this country anyway. Yeah, it's extensive. It's extensive. So I see the change.
and uh, for the better of our children, or their children, or the Polish people's children, or the Romanian's children who are settled here, they would not want people bringing in the drugs and the guns and doing what they're doing in this country for the better of their own families. Mm -hmm. For where you live, you want it to be a better society, don't you? I always wonder, um, you know, when uh, we, I've, I've got some Polish people that work for me in my studio and that, and them um, hard working, very, very Best. hard working. And I always wonder, right. and I have these conversations with her, and I say to them, like, you escape your country because it's so bad, but then you bring that mentality here. So you'll re you you'll carry yeah. on living that same mentality, you know. It's uh, I I don't understand it, but um, hopefully one day that we could all live in a better place. And I, I you know, I, the way society is going, I think that it's it's not in a good position. Why do we have to punish people? You go to Norway. Norway's got the lowest crime rate mm -hmm. in the world, and it's the best uh, for the uh, living standards in the world as well. Mm -hmm. Across the board, yeah, and they forgive. Look at that geezer that shot all them students. You know the judges shook his hand, but that's a cultural thing. Yeah, okay. But the the mother who one of the daughters got killed, she's forgiving him because it just eats me up hatred. So it's in their nature and their culture to forgive, which I can understand. Not everybody can do it, but mm. culturally, it's a beautiful country to live in. Uh, but I don't see this country going that way. No. I really don't because the country is indoctrinated to punish, 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 punish. Well, you'll punish. have no faith in this, in, in, in the, uh, anything to do with British standards in, in any way whatsoever, will you? Because you've been fitted up so, so extensively that I don't think that you'll ever be able to regain faith back in, in, in British, in Britain. The criminal justice system is corrupt to the core and it goes right the way through it. Okay, there's the good and the bad, but overall, you had the Bridgewater three, the Birmingham six, Guildford four. Yeah, I mean it is it, like when you when you lay them out like that, like one after the other. I've, I've you know I spoke to some of these people and uh, yeah, they were fully fully fitted. Like and that four was and five appeals. Crazy. Kenny Collins, Hatton Garden burglar. Mm -hmm. He's eighty years of age. Cancelled his esophagus. Served a three and a half. Still got a seven for the burglary. Took his house off him. Sold his house. Took his money. Took everything. All right. Now, they find them all 7 million quid, okay? Should have been 7 million amongst however many, okay? Yeah. So they're now serving, he got out for nine months, Kenny. He's now doing another seven for the 7 million pound fine. But he was on bail for nine months. He's in Wayland, okay, as a CCAT prisoner during the COVID, just been refused his DCAT, going to open conditions for the last however many months he's got, got left, of yeah. his sentence, 80 years of age. And to appeal his conviction, or the sentencing laws that he's been sentenced on in relation to the fine, he's been told that it's a uh, civil matter and he can't get legal aid for it. Yet he gets treated in the criminal justice system as a convicted burglar, because that's what the crime was, it was mm. burglary, and can't get through to a DCAT, an 80-year-old old man who was on bail. And now I know people that are getting tagged. Put him on a tag. He ain't going anywhere. He's yeah, on bail for nine months. Can't get out. Locked up. That's where the, the criminal justice system is wrong. And I see people getting let out for habitual drug offenders, committing drugs or all sorts of crimes that they should not be let out for because they're going to go straight back and do it again. Young kids or middle-aged men or whatever who are bang on the drink, bang on the drugs, and they're going to be back in, in, out, in, out, in, in, out. Kenny, eight years of age, can't get out mm. to a decat. That's where the criminal justice system is punishing a person because his case is high profile. And I had the same as many other people had the same. If you're high, pro high profile, you're going nowhere. I remember when I got off the book and Danny McAllister, like I say, was waiting for me. A screw come up to me and says, I don't know what you've done, he says. I've written on your file, he says, you ain't getting out, you're very old or dead. Wow. And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm going home, mate. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> Get my bags for me. Get my bags for me. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you a story about a screw, right? So I did a filming the other day for Rupert. Uh, it's going to be presented to Rupert Murdoch's channel, 2B. I was filming outside. I went to Adam Booth's boxing gym. So I train down there. I do a bit of training in there several times a week. And then I went from there. I went to Harefield where I grew up, filmed there. Went to High Down Prison. I just recently got released. Went from there 
to up the uh, booth boxing, shall I say, and went to see Duncan Campbell to film outside the Bailey. And there's a screw called George Shipton. And he, he was on one of my escorts when I was in the unit. And he was the first screw to open the door and introduced himself to me. He said, look, you've come here with a bad rep. They said, you're this, you're that, you're this, or that, you're fucking, and then you can have whatever you're entitled to. That's the best I can do. And I'll get you to talk to your family. So I said, thank you very much. That's all I want. I don't yeah. nothing more. You know, I'm not a demanding, what are you now? I'm going to smash up. I work, yeah. I work like that. And then my record showed later on in life. And I kept, you know, I was liked by staff and inmates so long. So I was pleased with that. I went to court and there was a screw, massive screw, big bodybuilder. And he was involved in uh, torturing and bashing up people in the scrubs at the time. And a, a load of them got nicked for even murder and waterboarding and such. And he kept threatening me. And George Shipton's gone, leave him alone, you ain't done nothing wrong. Why do you keep threatening him? Well, he kept on, he kept on. And a bit of call, helicopters and, you know, flying about in the KA van, guns and all that, bulletproof vest sitting in the KA van. I said, where's mine? Yeah. If you don't start shooting, I said, you might miss and get me. Yeah. Right, so I start all that, and snipers on the roof and all madness like that. That was. So you, your adrenaline's going. So we get back to the prison. You've got to take all your clothes off doing a strip cell. All right. Take your clothes off. You've took your socks off. You've got this screw in there. The cuffs are off now, aren't they? And they said to me, and I said, we'll kill you, Lane, if we get you down here. I said, take these cuffs off. We'll talk about it. I was 11 stone 7 at the time, you know, yeah, I wasn't yeah. a big fella, but, you know, I wasn't worried about how big he was. It yeah. didn't bother me at the time, you know. Don't tread on my toes, I won't stamp on yours. Yeah. Leave me alone and I'll leave you alone. So, the cuffs come off and I'm in the strip cell with him now and there's two of us in there, two screws and me. He's going, show me the part soles of your feet. I said, I've just shown you the soles of my feet. I said, would you think I'm a performing fucking clown? I said, don't keep on, I said, because I ain't going to suffer your bollocks. He said, that's what I like, but I me, crash, crash. Best punches I've ever thrown <laughs> in my life. <laughs> I wish my trainer had been. I went, crash, crash. He hit the wall, slid down, it went to sleep. We went to the other screw, it's all right, it's over. He threw his arms around me. <laughs> they come in, they bend you up, didn't they? Yeah, Bloody yeah, cuff yeah. you, carry you to a strip cell, cut your clothes off, you big shears. They didn't cut mine off. I said, you cut my fucking clothes off. I said, you take them off. So they took my clothes off, leaving the strip cell to get cold and freezing yeah. overnight and that, you know, on a bare concrete floor, like a bit of screeding outside your house. It's meant to you know, like, make you get Calm and that, you know? yeah. don't make you get angry because you're all, you're cold and you're hungry. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, anyway, George Shipton, he gave evidence for me. At, uh, I got Nick for GBH. Please come in and charge me. And he went to the governor of the prison. He said, I was there and it happened. He was threatening Lane all day, and he fucking, you know, he got what he deserved. And he, you know, so George had eight screws surrounding him. He said, you've got to make a full statement. He said, I'm not doing it. He said, I told him I'm to leave him alone. So when I was doing the filming the other day, this is a story. So when I'm doing the filming, outside the bailey with Duncan Campbell, for to be put forth for Netflix and Rupert Murdoch's channel by uh, Underworld TV, cabs come past, beep, beep, and I've looked. It's George Shipton. Now, the camera crew and, and the, 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 the filming crew, they thought I'd set it up. I said, that's George Shipton, he's in the book. And I told them the story about what I just told you. Phone George when we finished the filming, we had a cup of tea and that, he didn't answer. Then he phoned back, he said, I couldn't answer the phone, he said. And this is what makes it so authentic. He said, I had a passenger in the cab at the time, Kevin. So I didn't know I was coming past there. I hadn't told people I was coming to the Bailey, you know, yeah, if yeah. you kept it in-house. Her husband's a documentary and a filmmaker. She asked me about your story. And I was telling her, that's why I couldn't answer the, the, the phone, Kevin, right? So he just picked that cab up, that fare up. Yeah. That evening, a book was bought by a documentary filmmaker. No. Yeah, how about that? <laughs> you couldn't make it up for me. No, no, definitely not. And that was George Shipton. And then you get people like, he's, I've seen him now, and a fella called Phil Prout, I call him Knuckles. He's run boxing clubs. He's always trying to help kids to stay out of crime. And that. He's right. not a screw no more. He he's works for himself. He's done banners and T-shirts, fitting up and fighting back. Sent to me, bought a book. Bought banners and T-shirts and sent to my office for me to use. Wow. How about that? Nice. And he said, we've always believed in our innocence, Kevin. Other members of staff... How does that make you feel, hearing that? Humbled. Because Phil does a lot for charity and kids. He's always trying to help people. You know, he's always got... Yeah, but the fact stuff. that before he'd done all that lot, he's, um, he said to you, I've always believed in your innocence. That is powerful. Another member of staff have always said it. So we, we, we know, Kevin, we don't think you did it. Uh, and we think that your case stinks. 
they gave this out to me. When I got released on my recent release, the governor, Ian van der Sluis, you, you'd go out on the drink with him and get smashed in the best possible terms mm, of a couple of bottles yeah. of red wine, you know. He would come in and he'd have staff unload a trolley. Right? He was waiting for me when I left. He said, Kevin, he said, I'm really glad to see you going home. He said, honestly, he said, what a waste. You know, God bless him. I hope everything works out for you. Waiting to say goodbye to me. And you, again, thank God for the good, because I know that governor, Ian, he goes around, and he was, if he gets stopped, and he will write your name with that down, and he will go away and look into something himself. Do you know what it is? It's, it's, it's like, it's, it's crazy, because you must have come across such a, like, an imbalance of people, like them sitting there just being like, oh, you can fucking rot you, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And then you'll get others being like, I know you ain't done this, mate. I know. And, and you, that, whilst you're sitting in the cells trying to prove your innocence, which is heavily documented in, in piles of documents you've got beside you, as well as in your book. Yep. Very frustrating. What I found, I was very angry for a lot of years. So I took my anger out on the people in prison, like I discussed earlier. Mm -hmm. So I would, if someone come on the land and he was a bully back in the day, I'd make a beeline for him. I thought, right, you're getting it. So I took my anger out. And then I realised that the pen is mightier than the sword. Yeah. And it took me years to learn that and years to control my temper. And the anger, it was forever going like a, a volcano inside. And then become a little Bunsen burner. Little flick. You know, and, and I think that happened as a result of my, my girlfriend at the time got killed in a car crash. I wasn't allowed to go to the funeral. All stuff like that. And it just, it breaks you. People that stuff does break you, though. But it they, does break you. Like, you know, you're, you're, in, you're inside. There's nothing you can do. Someone's died. You, you, it's only right that you have the right, no matter what you've done, to be able to say goodbye to that person. It's the last time, right? Last and time. They, they take that away from you. It's, it's, that's got to reset up the, the you that you've been trying to manifest yourself away from. Very difficult because Razor Smith, you know, works for Inside Times. He's done a number of books. Changed his life around. His no. son. Yeah, no. Yeah, I'm, I'm with him at the end of the month. Lovely. Yeah. Proper fella. Yeah. Lovely fella. Yeah. Look what he's done with his life. Oh, massively. Massively. So I've been sent on a lay down. I come back from the lay down. The day Princess Diana got killed. All right, I'll come back. I'll never forget it. That's all I come to always remember it. Yeah, I got goosebumps when you said that. Yeah, yeah I remember it. So. And I went to see Noel. His son had got killed. Yeah. All right. It's either that or the uh, the towers. It was one of them two, anyway. But and they uh, wouldn't let him go, would they? Wouldn't let him go. Yeah. And he was gonna he was gonna kick off. But yeah. And he's in. He's I with him. He's put it in his book. And I said, "No, fucking, you can't do that, mate. You've got." To. And you know. But again, like you're talking about, Paul, the anger inside of you that you, it's it's multiplied. It's 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 under a magnifying glass, and it's just unbelievable because it's like a a pressure cooker. You can't get out of that door. You can't get on the phone because it's a queue. Yeah, and and it really is that way. Like for in, for instance, like if we get angry now, we take advantage of the space we have to be able to vent. Um, you yeah. know, you go upstairs. She, I don't know. She stays downstairs, or that person. You can just kick them out of your house or something like that. When you're inside, it's like. It's like getting really angry and then getting put in a toilet and closing the door. That's all it is. When I found out that my girlfriend got killed, I was put back in a cell and the door locked. No TV, bare walls. And that room probably felt smaller than what it ever did whilst you was living in it on a daily anyway. Concrete coffin. I was in a coffin and my girlfriend was in a coffin. That is it. No help, no comfort. Can't go out and walk down the, around the countryside. Mm -hmm. Can't go and walk in the fresh air. In a cell. So it's, you're just constantly, there's nothing to distract you. Well, out that door, you get distracted, bird mm, singing or yeah. whatever, you know, it's a, some form of distraction. So times like that change a person. Mm. And it took me many years before I realised the path I was on, fighting my case, but still fighting it in a manner that 
on the landings, which I had to get a grip of, which I did. But you still always will meet the arseholes. Yeah. Yeah, that's without a doubt. That's just life in general. You're going to come across them for sure, 100%. But you haven't, you're not slow. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying to you? You're not, you're, you're far from a man. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't look you in the eyes and see that you've, you, you've, you're lost. I can't see that whatsoever. I see a very hungry man that's, that's known um, in his innocence and believed Obviously, because you, you you would know if you've done right, so you, you you don't you don't come across like you've you've been slowed at all in any way whatsoever. I'm not as hungry as I once was. Mm. I was a lot more driven before, but I appreciate that. Um, it's, do people handle things differently? And I know that um, if it wasn't for the the wherewithal that I've got within me, mm -hmm. then I may have turned to drugs. I may I used to have a drink, and you couldn't come to my Drink on a Friday night. I mean, my prison record said, "Ooch." So, lame drinks, manage him. <laughs> but I don't bother. You'd come in. You'd have to dress up. You couldn't come in. You didn't dress up like he was going out on a Friday night. Yeah. And uh, you can only come if there was no problems. I wouldn't have you getting drunk if there was a problem. On yeah. Drink. Yeah. And we used to dance. You know, do now. Laughing your socks off. And if you hadn't got through that, by having that laughter and that dancing, I've cried with laughter, okay, one Christmas, where it was so funny from the people I had in that cell with me. Cry, and others were crying with laughter yeah. from some of the antics that was going on. And if it got me through it, because you come out the other end of it, where well, you've released that emotion. Yeah. So cuddling gives you an emotion. Prisoners cuddle a lot. Some cuddle for the wrong reasons. But a lot of men cuddle for the right reasons. Yeah. Because they're missing that comfort. And if you ask a psychologist, they've got a name for it. I can't recall what it is. But, you know, you, you need that embrace and that comfort. And that's why prisoners do embrace all the time. And if, if you don't have certain forms of, should I say, comforts, or uh, whether it's drink or drugs, and they can't handle the, the time, so they turn to drugs, that's a comfort. But it's the wrong comfort. Mm -hmm. My comfort was my paperwork and my gym and my visits and my alcohol. Yeah. But you could come and have a drink with me, and I used to get drunk and enjoy myself. In dispersals. I'll never forget it, right? Wayne Owen. They did a film about him called Armed and Dangerous, right? Yeah. Most notorious armed robber this country had ever seen, okay? He's dead now, God rest his soul. We was in the unit with him. And we, they used to have cameras in the TV room. So we're sitting here now. You've got all glass here. Got a camera on the set, camera on the set. Every 20 minutes he'd come in walk around us, bang the bars, walk back out, standing outside watching us with the cameras on us, all right? Every 20 minutes. That's when I was exceptional risk in the unit. So I've got a booze down there now, didn't I? All right? I said, we get a booze. No, they go in your cell all the time as well. Check your cell twice a day at least, in your cell and look about. You have a knife, fork and spoon, two hangers, that's it. Dead bolts on the door with a padlock. That's how, and they check you every half hour. Yeah. In, all through the night, checking you. Checking you, checking you, right? So it's even playing with your sleep as well. Playing with your sleep, right? So I got a booze down there, didn't I? And Wayne, he was a big fella, Wayne. He put the dressing going on. Five gallon litre, put it down in his box of shorts. <laughs> Last cane runs, <laughs> and he just walked along, <laughs> <laughs> nice and slow in the TV room between his legs, dressing going over it. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> when the film finished, you had to bang up. Back in here, back down his boxer shorts, into someone else's cell, <laughs> <laughs> walking about. And I got that booze down in there. I thought, yeah, where there's a will, there's a way. Yeah. And we got a drink down in the unit. They were mortified that we had got a drink down in that unit. Because you got it past them. Got it past them. We got it past them a few more times after that. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, have a drink. And it started in the unit. I thought, bollocks to you, like, yeah. I'll have a drink. No, I'm, I'm in my cell. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I've had some good times in the prison. But like you say, prison will change people. and Or they will change when they're ready to change. They've had enough of coming to prison. They have a baby. It was a life-changing matter. Oh, yeah, I think um, the, the, the need for want uh, or the want for need to change is um, essential to change. You know, yeah. uh, I don't think it can be forced upon you. I don't think that you can fake it. I think um, if you're ready to change, you know. 
and that's when life will change for you. You know, Paul, I agree with you there. But if I must touch on prisons have this prison system tries to help people, but they're not helping them in the right manners in terms of skills. Mm. So High Down's got a bike shop. Great, teach people to fix bikes. Can I go and get a job fixing bikes? Hopefully, some of them can. But tools of the, of the trade, what people need to learn. They do paint and they do a bit of brickwork, but they're small workshops. Yeah. Very small. And there's, I, on my recall, I got recalled recently, and uh, the Secretary of State said, get him out. We've, he's done nothing wrong. After a, a lengthy investigation, I spent a long time on prison again for something I hadn't done, mm -hmm. clearly hadn't done. And I've been uh, found, obviously, to have been telling the truth. But I spent a considerable amount of time in prison again because of this conviction of a life sentence around my neck, so I'm always on licence. But during that time, I got a job in the gym. So whilst I was in that gym, only six weeks, and then I got released. Uh, you do one week on, one week off, because there's no work. So yeah. people's behind their doors. During COVID, some days you don't even get exercise. Yeah, they're 30-day bang-ups, aren't they? And you're looking at this, for the kids who can't do their bang up, mm. they will turn to spice or whatever they can get their bloody hands on because they're that spice their hair is really up. like hit prison hard, isn't it? It is a terrible drug mm -hmm. what that has done to people. Terrible, yeah. I've seen people go into jail normal and because you know they they haven't looked took in prison very well, they've turned to spice and they've come out their heads not ruined. There. The head's not there at all. Ruined. And they will smoke that gear forever or they'll smoke something else. Mm -hmm. They should have prisons that if you want to be, if you're coming off the drugs and you're serious about coming off it, make every single visitor in that visit closed. Permanently closed. Because you're going in there for the better of you and your family. So you can suffer closed visits for six months. Uh, behind the screen, you behind mean? Behind the yeah, screen. Yeah. So yeah. if the drugs are coming in, they're coming in through the post or whatever. Or they could put in restrictions, I would suggest. Mm -hmm. But you're going there to get dry, get clean, so yeah. that you can live a life again. Yeah. Make it a drug-free prison. Not a drug-free wing where you can go to church bumping or someone in the past or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, yeah. All a, it's all a bleeding game. Yeah. But there's things I think the prison system could do. Because if I was bang on drugs and say, get me out of this prison to a prison where there's no drugs, I'll have no visits. Or I'll have closed visits. Total, total, total. Total, total. And I will do all the programmes, I'll get in the gym, and I'd make everybody go to the gym. I don't care who you are. You go to the gym twice a week where you've got to sit on a bike or you've got to walk on a treadmill. Maybe there's an alpha program that you could create. Well, I'm trying to get back into the prisons. To uh, Some of my recommendations were made in High Down when I was last there. And I feel I've got something to offer for the better of the system and the inmates. I, I, I believe that too. Yeah. From just talking to you, I believe that you, you can be very beneficial to the prisons because I believe... Yeah, from just meeting you today, that um, you'd be able to connect with a lot of people. They'd pay attention to you m more mm. so over some of the other people, which is beneficial from the, from the, from the get-go. You know, so that's, that's, that's for them to be able to have someone to be able to connect with, then they'd be able to tell you and talk to you. Um, I think you are that person. I've been there and done it, Paul. Thank you. Fair. But I don't preach to people. No. Nah. I talk from the heart. And yeah, I say, Look, exactly. This is the way forward. So when I did my things I did in the prison system, whether it was, um, you know, I've gone in a cell, pushed the door up, had a tear up with someone. Believe me, they've done something wrong. Yeah, yeah. And the, the, the prison staff haven't been able to rectify it. A pal of mine, married recently, he was having some difficulties. And I've been on a lay down, come back, they sent me to Franklin. And I was in the block with someone, he was owed some money by someone. His wife and kids was owed some money. I've just met you in the block out the window. I didn't really go out the window. Charlie was there at the time. Charlie Bronson, he was there chatting away with Charlie. And then, so I'd, go, I'd get put in the block. I wouldn't go out the window. For, I don't want to talk my business at the window. But anyway, so I've met you in the block, had a chat over. You said this geezer owes you some money. I said, if I see him, I'll ask him for the money. For your wife and your children. He's got the bleeding money and he ain't paid you. So for your wife, I would take umbrage of that. It's not even my problem. Yeah, yeah. So... I, was, I got sent to Franklin. Paul Ferris came up to me, the wee man. Great film. Yeah. And he says, right, Kevin, Paul, blah, blah. I don't know, Paul, blah, blah, blah. We had a chat. Uh, 
give me some bits and pieces, some cleaning materials, that he, you know, difficult to get hold of. He had them. Um, and I've walked up the stairs like a barn. And I've gone up the stairs, there's loads of screws sitting there, and there's a kitchen there. And the fella that owes him the money was called Goldie. Goldie, because he had red hair. And he's a Geordie. How many Goldies of red hair can there be? Yeah. Banged up. Yeah. And it was him. All right, so he's come out, of the, so he's gone, why are you Kevin, lad? My name's Kevin, my name's Goldie, he says. We'll cook you some dinner here. Eh? Well, don't fucking talk to me. I said, you owe my mate 1,500 quid. I said, if you don't pay, I said, I'm going to punch your head in. I said, damn, Jim, no, I'll never fuck off. All right, so that's how I was then at that time. Yeah. But the moral of the story is this, okay? Well, I was living, the, I thought, which was right. I looked over to my left and I see a little fella, a tiny little fella, beaming with a smile. I said, hello, mate. All right, Kevin, pleased to meet you. He said, I said, come around and see me tomorrow. I'll cut the tea. I had a little chat with him and that. That fella there was considering taking his life that night because that Goldie had been bullying him. Ah. Oh. All right, giving him grief in the prison. Probably giving him grief. And he, he said to me, Kevin, I was, you know, I think I'd taken my life that night. But after what that, he said, he didn't. I went round to that Goldie, right? He was getting notes put under his pillow, my little mate. I was meant to be best man at his wedding, but I got recall, so I didn't get to go to it. Oh, I? It's gutted. Yeah. All these years later, all things are turned around, yeah. right? Little, my little, I'm not going to say his name because I ain't got his permission, but yeah. um, he knows who he is, and I love him dearly and his missus. And he's put notes back under his pillow. He said, when the other fella goes back down south, you're getting it. So I went round, I knew it was him. I went round to this fella, and I says, I deputise you to take care of my mate. I said, if anything happens to him, I'm holding you responsible. <laughs> 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 Love it ever happened to him. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a laugh and a joke about the way, you know, doing good in the prison. Yeah. But sometimes you're doing good the wrong way. Mm -hmm. But society has to recognise you're in a jungle there. Yeah. And you deal with the rules that are put in front of you. But society wants you to come to, to them and, and lead a law-abiding life. Well, that's okay. But it doesn't work like that. So I've just been doing a bit of work with restorative justice. They've been contacting me because I kidnapped a fella many years ago. And it was part of this gang who was doing stuff. They was nicking some equipment off of my power. The police were contacted. The police couldn't do nothing. Uh, it's a business, man. Uh, this gang then threatened a the girl. They've had a knife on them. They threatened the girl with a knife and a baby. So they were going to cut her and a baby. So my mate come back to me and said, can you help us? Because they've now been back to the office as well. So I went and kidnapped one of these gangs. But the fellow I kidnapped was a storeman who was handing out the equipment, nicking it out, apparently, okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I took him away, uh, I roughed him up, I run him over a few times, and he was in hospital a week, didn't even know his own name. I regret that, Paul, because I did it to the wrong person. He wasn't the fellow with the knife. Yeah. Now, there's many people out there fathers of daughters and, and granddaughters and said, if he'd done that to my daughter, I'd kill him. See how people think? Yeah. But because sitting on the outside looking in, I kidnapped him and so said, that was terrible. But what would you have done if it was your daughter? Yeah. All right? And so I'm working with restorative justice with this fellow that I did, and I look forward to seeing him and speaking You're to him. You're going to meet up with him again. Meet up with him yeah. and say, I'm so sorry for what I did to you. He ended up in the canal afterwards. Bobbing about, fella come along and pulled him out. I mean, I think he fell in the canal. I didn't put him in there. <laughs> <laughs> no, joking aside, of course, Your Honour. <laughs> but at allegedly. that time, <laughs> allegedly, but at that time, I mean, he couldn't swim because his legs were been run over a few times. But you know, I'm glad he's alive, and I'm glad I can laugh about it now. But I was wrong. What I did, mm -hmm. I went to prison for that. The jury found me guilty after a trial, two trials, in fact. I got bail because the police were caught falsifying statements and all sorts of other stuff that went on. And I got bail and I went, I went away 14 months later. And the jury said they made a the wrong decision. Came back and told the judge they made a the wrong decision. With putting you away? Putting me away. And the judge said I took the law into my own hands. Vigilante type of stuff, you know? Yeah. So there's a very fine line at times. But I committed an act of a criminal act that is wrong. If I'd have done it to the fellow with the knife... I thought, well, I shouldn't have done what I'd done. He deserved it. Yeah. I can live with that. But I went away for... I got two years, two years, two years, two years to run concurrently instead of consecutively. 
And the judge said, no, there's been an appeal. And I said, I don't appeal. Forget it. I didn't give evidence. I did it. I'm happy with that. But because of what I did to the fella I did, I regret that. Yeah. But I regret that now, all these years later. Not when I was a young bloke full of testosterone. Yeah, it's mad how you, you do view things very, very differently. Um, emotionally, too, how you, how you, you, you absorb that information um, is very, very different from when you've got the testosterone of, like, I want to be big and bad, to... Yeah, I'm a that, man like, of the world. Like, yeah. I mean, when you start, when you take away all of that, like, you know, like, you know, pe- pe- you're thinking that people respect you, and they, they really don't, because once you do go to jail or you die... People are happy that you're gone. Yeah. You know, and if you was truly respected for the right things that you'd done in your life, um, people would be, they would be down. They would be sad that, that you died or you've yeah, been taken right, yeah. away. You know, that, that's real respect. And I don't think a lot of these kids, especially today, um, realize that um, gaining respect long term is from good acts, not bad. I wrote, uh, people should be more mindful of their actions because they have lasting effects on people. Mm. And I hope I haven't had a lasting effect in a damaging way to the fellow I kidnapped and many other things I've done over the years. But I wrote a cha- uh, uh, I was asked to write a piece in a book called Respect and Reputation by Charles Bronson. Uh, he said, can you write a par- few paragraphs, Kevin? So I ended up writing nine or 11 pages now, I can't recall. It didn't change one word of it. I said, respect and reputation. Some people chase respect and reputations. It's the wrong way. People Respect and uh, a reputation can be gained without even trying to get a reputation. Yeah. Respect can be given for exact reasons you've just said, because you give other people respect, or you, you're not shoulders back man, or you're a very humble man, mm. and you know, you're just going, but you're not looking for any problems, and people respect that. If you were a four foot five uh, fella and you hit a geezer with a train had been bullying you you'd get respect mm-hmm. and you'd get a reputation if you was a six foot five fella going around bashing little fellas and taking off their canteen you'd get a reputation but you wouldn't get respect mm. there's a difference isn't there but they think they've got respect yeah because people are fighting of them mm-hmm. and, and I think that's where a lot of people falsify the the um uh, I don't even know how to put the words in there but um, where they believe that they got respect because of who they are or what what they are what, like what from, from mental fear. but yeah but it's not it's through fear absolute mental through fear and and of course they thrive off of that they you know they walk through the town centre or they walk through the prison yard or whatever and everyone's like you're right you're right you're right and they're not saying it because they want to know that you're okay they're saying it because they don't want you to lump them they're absolutely shitting themselves and yeah. think, you are a nasty piece of work. Absolutely horrible, cunt. But they'll say, oh, he's right, he is, you know, because they don't want that. So they, they, they're gaining these people, is gaining notoriety within their life uh, where they feel like it's a long-term, a long-term solution and it really isn't. I used to bleed and you know what? Uh, when I was a bit wild when I went away for a few years. It's, you know, for the, like, the, the underdog... So you'd have these fellas on the landings, and you know, they, you could tell they was through the weight about a bit, you know, in a manner where, you know, there's a lot of blokes in the prison. They're in there for committing acts against crimes against people because of whatever reasons. But I used to, uh, I used to torment them in a nice way, you know, like, mm-hmm. and, the, and the lads, not torment them in, in a such way I'm being a bully, but, I, you know, I can't say. Gonna be your tough fella in your outside. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you done to me outside. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, I bet you can fight, can't you? <laughs> hey, do you want to do a bit of sparring? <laughs> <laughs> and then I ran it a couple of times like that. And I had a, in the book, right, I had a row with a guy called Frenchie. And uh, he, he was in for cutting Paula Radcliffe's boyfriend many years ago. Frenchie, Frenchie. A black fella. Like, black fella. Enough, yeah. yeah, but he was in the French Foreign Legion, I reckon. Right? So I don't know how true it was, but he had a bleeding big shape to him. Yeah. You know, right? So he was going around the land, he's trying to take over. And he, I said, it ain't like that. You know? What are you doing? It, calm down. Yeah. So I had a straightener with him. And the bloody, they loved it, the fellas. Because <laughs> <laughs> he was causing mayhem in yeah. the system. So he come and asked me for a bleeding straightener. All right? Oh, yeah, no problem. Whenever you want. And he always had a straightener with me. 
because he wanted to get me out of the way. Because if he ironed me out, because I was known for being able to have, hold my hands up, yeah. he had a free run. Yeah. Now, how mad is that? Mm. And where he's, he wanted to take over selling phone cards and all, all I was just fucking hell, I didn't. I didn't sell phone cards. You need your phone cards for your phone. Yeah. He was wanting to deal with that, you know? Um, you, be, you oh. Being who you were, was, to our, yeah, 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 being who you was at that time in your um, criminal career, you must have been a target for a lot of people that had come in because you was a people's person. Like you yeah, said, yeah, like yeah. You, you said, you know, you see a bully, you, you, you straightened it out straight away. So people would, all these, all these people that couldn't be, they would look up to you because you would take them under their wing. That must have put you on the line a lot. <coughs> oh. If you don't like seeing, like John Wayne, he's one of my favourite actors, probably my favourite. I love Rooster Cockburn. Mm-hmm. Right, I love it. I think it's a great film. He's always there for the underdog. So I don't like to see people being bullied or injustice being done to people. But yeah. I've got to done that to the fellow I kidnapped. Yeah. You know, you can't, you know, you need to get your head on straight in, in a roundabout way, but a little bit of differences, of course, you know. So you can either be very popular in prison or very lonely. Yeah. Both of them have their benefits and the negatives. Yeah. Right? If you're very popular, you've got everybody's problems. So, oh, Kevin, he's just done that to me. He's just done. So, Joe Hartfield, his son was Charlie, he used to play for Arsenal and uh, Millwall and people like that. Joe only ate egg and bacon and ice cream. It's all he ate, English food. He wouldn't yeah. eat a curry. Nothing like that, right? We were old school. There's a fella called Joey Hartfield. Uh, 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 Johnny Bravo, his nickname. I'm not going to give his real name, but Johnny Bravo, his nickname, because of the size of him. Yeah. Bodybuilder. He'd been in Nick Charlie's. Uh, uh, um, Joey's canteen. He said, Kevin, he took my car. I said, people nick people's canteen, Joe. He said, yeah, but Kevin, he won't give it back to me. I said, if you ask him, he said, yeah, he won't give it back to me. I said, I'll have a word with him. What he did was he hadn't nicked it from Joe. He nicked it off the counter, right? And then he's taken it, knowing that Joe's there anyway. He knows it's his thing. Now, Joe's, and then he's got no canteen. Just wrong what he's doing anyway. He's an old boy. Joe was like nearly 70. So I said, I'll have a word with him. He got wind, I was going to have a word with him. I've walked in the back of a laundry room. My mate there was Forrest Nelson was in now. I've, he's walked to the back of the thing, turned around, he's got a cup in his hand. Came on. It went off. I've been having a row with this fella. He's cracked me at the top of the head with a cup, split me head open. I had to stick a load of uh, gear in it to stop it bleeding, out on it. Uh, in, ended up, I ended up pulling him back in. I broke my hand, all right, having a row with him. Knocked him out, pulled him back in by his feet. Gone to the gym, patched it up, kept a bob of that on, all right, on the hat, all right. And there's a big gash like that, pissing out my blood, running down my face, right. For having a word with someone over nicking someone else's canteen. I'll never forget it. Peter Fury, we used to train together, me and Peter. Hardest man I've ever been hit by. Could split a pair of gloves in within six weeks. God, could he punch. Tyson's dad. Right? Tyson's yeah. uncle, okay. Peter was trained by uh, Brendan Ingle, schooled by him. Yeah, yeah. And you'll see Tyson's got the same sort of uh, box. And he's in the book, Tyson, Peter, they're all in it. So when I had to go and have a word with this Johnny Bravo, as a man's man that I am, Peter says, do you want me to come and stand outside? Uh, I'll come and stand outside the cell, Kevin. I said, nah, Peter, I'm going on my own, mate. I'll do it on my own, it'll be done, you know. And Peter said, all right, Kevin, no problem. You know, he's a man's man, Peter. Yeah. He's come from a fighting school, yeah, didn't he? Yeah, like, you know, yeah. he knows that. And, that, and that, that's what you've got in the prison system. But not so much anymore. Now, you'll have three or four people come in a cell mm. to weigh you in. And they all hit each other because they can't get to the fellow they're trying to hit. <laughs> it's mental. But the old school morals like that are gone. Gone. Just gone. Would you be a criminal now? Not if, if you was young, If you was young and you reset, you could reset the time... And you had it now, would you be a criminal today? Not a chance. Do you know, I've always worked. From a, that film I did the other day for hopefully Rupert Murdoch's channel, they filmed me outside the, uh, the news agents at 12 years of age, age. Then I went to the bakers, then went to the chip shop. Then I was working with a builder four days a week instead of going to school because I got expelled. Mm-hmm. And then into the chip shop at night. And I'd be on flat at 15 with a pal of mine who was 18. All right, working. What I achieved through work, I would never have achieved through crime. Yeah. 
And all these kids that think, sell a bit of coke, sell a few tickets, do this, do that. Yeah, I'm the gangster, everyone's coming to me. It's a mug's game. Yeah. Because you will get nicked at some point. You will have your door kicked through. You will have your family and that visiting you or your daughter or whatever, having to come and visit you in prison. And you will spend years in prison. Hopefully, I mean, listen, obviously it doesn't happen to some people, but that's the nature of your game. Yeah. Well, you can go to work, you can earn a, a decent living, and if you put the effort into going to work, you'll be a lot happier, and you'll sleep sit more at night and being involved in a drug that ruins people's lives. Because people don't go home on that coke, they're chasing it all the time, they're spending their wages, they don't go to work on a Monday, they destroy their relationships. I don't agree with it, I don't like it. Most of the time end up using it themselves. Using it themselves. But then they'd have a problem with it if they was getting if it was getting sold to their sister or something like that, you know. Look, you got Kenny Collins. Kenny's an habitual criminal. He said, "I've been a criminal since I was five, Kevin, because there's no roofs on the buildings when I was five. She used to climb in them. We become burglars <laughs> after the first world, War, second world war." Yeah. He said, "I've always, you know." He said, "I did a bit of work once in the timber yard." He says, "Hardest bit of graft I've ever done." But that's the nature there, where. You had the dockers getting all the gear and you'd always get fags or stockings or booze, you know. That was accepted then, that way of fevering. Yeah. But now it's not like that, is it? No. Crimes have changed. They're more nasty, more violent, more drug and fueled crimes. Definitely, so, definitely more drug fueled um, crimes happening more now than what there ever was from way back when. Like you say, you had the docks. So you would get your hands on pretty much anything and you'd wheel and deal. That's what it was, wheel and deal. Wheel and deal and Wheel and deal in old school. Yeah, I know a vicar that buys knocked off fags. Yeah, he buys, he, he buys the snides, right? Yeah, yeah. He gets the snides fags, but he smokes them. Right? Yeah. Now, he'd probably be frowned upon now, but I mean, he's probably got quite a liberal view. Mm. I just don't see that kids see it as, they see crime as, films portray criminals as the heroes. Yeah. Which is wrong. There's a film out in a minute by Craig Fairbrass. It's just a film called Villain. Villain, yeah. I watched, I watched it the other night. Yeah, I watched it the other night as well. Very small budget. Excellent film. Excellent actor. Is that the one where they had the pub and the two... Yeah, two yeah, yeah, brothers, yeah, okay? Yeah, yeah. That there is a bang-on situation of what's going on in society out there now. In the different levels of different things that happen, of course. But basically, you take the, the ingredients of that film. It's drugs, it's debt, it's crime. It's police, it's violence. And it's happened in various forms across this country. I, I think that film targeted quite a lot of, um, like, the, you know, um, the old school way. Yeah. Um, drugs. Yeah. Which is ruining lives. Mm. Uh, a, a, a con that's come out that's trying to be good. Get on. Trying to. Um, being absorbed back into it, yeah. not through his own measures by his Others. brother and drugs. Yeah. And then, of course, the new 21st century criminal shooting you on the back of a motorbike. Forced to do what he knows best because he's got to get money, otherwise, they're going to take his pub off him. Yeah. So he's gone back to doing what he did. And it's a shame. But again, look at the outcome of that film. I'm mm. not going to give the outcome of that film, but I thought it was an excellent film. I really did like it. For the budget that it had. Very much so. And I think that's what made that film so good, was the budget. Yeah. Um, because it made it raw. It made it real. It made it like, wow, that really is happening. The, I think the acting was great. Mm -hmm. didn't it? it just goes to show, doesn't Got it? the right people. The right, right people. people yeah. But that's a good portrayal of the system that's out there at the moment. And... It's, I always say angels with dirty faces and you've got uh, uh, James Cagney's crying before he's going to get electrocuted. Mm -hmm. And he was asked to do that, I think it was by the vicar, so the kids could hear about that and they wouldn't want to be a hero no more. I said, well, he cried. Yeah. Because he got on it as he's going to the bleeding electric chair. What a waste of life. And I spent, I spent 24 years in prison, me. Oh, I, I made the best I could of my life in there. I studied, like I say, and I, I got a distinction in sports and nutrition and I can write my own representations to the Court of Appeal and, you know, I send letters and say, oh, your, your solicitor's obviously drafted this and no, I am. And they look at you and they go, oh. So I've educated myself in a manner, but I wish I didn't have to do that in prison. Mm. I wish I could have seen my two sons grow up. Yeah. I've got three sons now, but 
I wish I had to do that. But I will say this to all the viewers and that. Things happen for a reason. And you have to make the best of that situation. And not just continuously be a hamster on a wheel going round and round and round and round and round. Look for the positives and the negative. And whatever it is, at least you don't feel so hard so done by. Yeah. You know, and go forward in life. And it's one life, you've got to live it. This is true. It's true. I'm I'm a big thing on um, manifesting information in a correct manner. You know, like um, you know, you get there. There is really a positive in every single negative scenario. You've just got to try and accept that information and then put it back out there in a positive way. You know. So I right, then I'll throw this back at you. Right, freezing cold weather. Mm -hmm. You go outside. Your cock goes that small. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> What's the positive in that? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, ladies, I shouldn't be talking like the that. The positive was um, the size that you allowed yourself to still be <laughs> after you was cold. It goes that small. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got to try and find the, the positives and the negative. You have to, I think, because if you consume yourself with so much negative energy, you ain't going to progress to anything that you can, f you know that you can fill yourself to. I love work. Get up and go to work. Yeah, 100%. Make something work. 100%. I never understand why people stay in bed till like 10, 11 o'clock. I don't get it. I've already done five five hours by yeah. then, you know, and it's, um, you know, and I, I, I think exercise is a massive thing as well. Great for the brain. You know that we touched earlier. Go to the bleeding gym. What, whatever you've got to do, get up and do something. Mm -hmm. And eventually you might just grab one person who will end up enjoying that gym. Yeah. And then it's another fellow who's not laying on his bed because you become old age pensioners in prison, especially during lockdown. Yeah. Laying on your bed or sitting in your chair. Yeah. Doing nothing. Mm -hmm. And other than smoking them bloody And that is a fast, that's a fast track to um, knowing what your life's going to be. Yeah. Do you understand? Yeah. And if you don't like it, do something about it because you can. You can, yeah. You can. 100%. Go to work. Earlier on, we touched about. Uh, the Polish being hard work, they are. They are hard workers. And I've employed a lot of people on the building sites up and down the country. And I find that foreign nationals turn up. Yeah. Good old English lads, my own mates as yeah. well, I'll have. Not just that. Yeah. We'll go on the booze on the bleeding Monday and they yeah. might turn up on the, on the Sunday, they might turn up on the Monday. Yeah. But you, you get a foreign national, they will be there to earn their money. Yeah, 100%. And you've got to put your hand out to them. Didn't you? Look at the state of the country now, because we, we ain't got people that will go to work. Yeah, there's enough people on the dole. Yeah. Or, or whatever they call it, bleeding universal credits. I think so. I reckon this is what I saying. Some people won't like me for this. I say, you want universal credits? Well, I'm telling you now, come Monday or Tuesday, you're going to be here and you're going to do that. Oh, disability. Got a bad yeah. Fucking yeah. like hell, you were dancing Friday night, all right, down the park, I'll see you. I, 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 I think there's so many farms and that lot that are struggling, so many businesses that are struggling. If you're getting free money, they should put you to graft. And then you'll watch, you'll do a full, a full, a full week's graft for your £28 a fortnight or whatever. Yeah, you'll yeah, soon yeah, be yeah. like, do you know what? I'm not doing this anymore. Yeah. I'm going to go and go to work. Even if you make them do two days a week, three days a week. Listen, the, 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 the benefits from working at McDonald's is massive. You know, in in yourself, it's massive because you can you can upgrade so fast, yeah. and you're getting a wage, and you get free food, so you don't even have to buy food. You get oh, you love that a bit of free food now, <laughs> didn't you? <laughs> but it's so true. Like you know, I'm I'm I sit there and say I'm a proud man, but if I had to work, it, um, if I had to go to work scrubbing toilets to be able to put food on my on the table for my children, I will scrub the toilets. Go to work. I will scrub the toilets. There's... What makes all these prisoners think that they can't work for £250 a week, but they go and work for £7 a week in prison? Yeah. All day long. Yeah. And you think, well, you, you've not got it right. And I just wish that uh, maybe people looked at things a little bit different. So I've got a tattoo there, One Life Live It, Ollie. That's what it stands for. Yeah. One Life Live It. And, you know, it's not just for to get out there, make the best of your life you can, be kind to other people, and just get on with your life. And you know, so, like, you've got Iran, Iran, for instance. They punish them with medical supplies, and their children are dying. Don't you think if we gave them medical supplies and said, there we go, the parents of them children say, Britain, you wouldn't be alive today if it weren't for Britain. Yeah. What do you want to bomb Britain for? 
they've saved my children. Yeah. You know, with the nuclear bombs. Why do you want... All these countries where we're punishing, bring them to the table and give. Why is it the IRA, Jerry McGuinness and... and uh, uh, Martin McGuinness, actually, should I say. Uh, they were in the IRA, weren't they? Yeah. Jerry Adams. One minute they're terrorists, the next minute they're invited into... Number 10. Mm, Parliament, yeah. Parliament. And why was that? Was that because we come to the table for the Good Friday Agreement and start negotiating properly? And it only happened when the IRA started bombing the capital in the money centre. And as soon as we hit this country for money, we want to talk. Yeah. Which it shows, doesn't it? Yeah. Wrong. And I think that the politicians, not all of you, of course, but I think sometimes the structure of uh, going forward in this world shouldn't be punishment. It should be decent negotiation, become a friend. We help you, you help us. Mm -hmm. I know it's hard with some cultures yeah. and that, but, you know, you've got, in bleeding some parts of the world, we've got kids going out, with, training kids with guns and chopping arms off. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult in there. Yeah. But that's education, I think. And uh, But still, I still think punishing people for prison, by way of example, isn't the best way forward. Uh, containment, yes, maybe, definitely, because you've got to have some people in prison, mm -hmm. but definitely not. I think England needs to relook really at the system badly because we're following America. You've got land is now full up with people who ain't going home for many years. When they do go home, they will have nothing left. They've got that one prison that's in, in America. They call it Disneyland. Um, it's actually proven quite a success turnaround. Um, but people that are um, you know, killing people in prison and stuff that they've earned their way to be in this this prison where there's zero tolerance on violence or um, any gang related or anything, and it seems to be seems to be working. Um, That's good. Look, yeah. Michael Jackson's monkey down there. <laughs> <laughs> they've picked up all his animals now, haven't they? <laughs> he had a zoo, didn't he? The poor sort. Yeah, he couldn't keep yeah. it going, could he? Uh, or something like that. Yeah, who, who loads of money? So I think they, the zoo, local zoos, they took, they took the animals as, they? as the as the Their collateral. business. But that's the Disney World, George Sands. It's different, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah the um, the the prison that they've done there, the the, in, the inmates. It's actually a documentary on Netflix. I'll, I'll have to try and remember what it is and yes, then a message up. But uh, the inmates call it. They all call it Disneyland because it's like you're still in prison. Yeah, but you're free to walk around the prison, and you like they're they're doing paintings like this on the yeah, wall, and yeah. and they're like cleaning the whole prison rather than just their cells, and they're like maintaining themselves a lot better, and they're not like they're not cursing, they're not doing anything because they know that if they mess up here, they go back to where. I mean, yeah, and that's terrible where they're coming from. Yeah, you will have the odd fall. Of course, that has human nature. No, but they've they've got this program. It's like an alpha program, and um, if you feel like you uh, have some unsettlement towards another prisoner, they get you together, and they make you talk about it, and it's working. Do you know what I used to say in prison? Get a boxing ring, and if I've got a beef with the man over there. Big or sure, you two get in the ring. Yeah, and it does settle down to the old school way. And I think, you know, less people fighting. Uh, how many friends were forged for life through having a punch-up and then going to the pub afterwards? Yeah, yeah. How many friendships were forged? Do you imagine that half of the criminals that become friends for life probably punched each other up once? It's, they, they talk about it's breeding violence, but I tell you what, if it come to it, if they had this, back in the old days in Borstal, I never went to Borstal, but listen, that's what he's used to do, million and that. It'd sort out the men from the, the boys. But you see, we're talking about Disney World, what you just said. Um, what's that? Papillon. Yeah. There's a film, isn't it, just yeah. coming out, okay? So I say this. That, that's actually a true story. Yeah, I know it is, yeah. Yeah, true story. Brilliant. Mm, Brilliant absolutely film. amazing. But you know what they should do with the, uh, the paedophiles of the world and the rapists and that? Stick them on an island and let them live amongst themselves that they can't get off. You have mm. to police it, of course, because there'd be murders on there yeah. and all sorts. But they're going to carry on committing their crime. Yeah. I know that. Psychologists, like, they cannot be cured. There's no cure for what they do. It's a thirst. It's like a drug. Yeah. Stick them on an island. That's where you go and you live amongst yourselves. And our children and our women and our men will be safe. And that's what I think. Just chuck them over there and see you later. Yeah. Yeah, that is a really good film, though. Brilliant film. Oh. I like the. I preferred the Steve McQueen one. 
Oh, right, yeah. The original one. I really yeah. do. Dustin Hoffman in it. Mm -hmm. I like the second one. Good film still. Uh, a little bit more inform it, it, it's better it's better in some ways but I yeah. prefer the old story yeah, yeah. I enjoyed Royster Cogburn the new one in the old one but I prefer John Wayne's one best <laughs> the original you like John Wayne I, I love John Wayne I think he's a, he's a man's man so, so when um, so when you bought the book out yeah what troubles did that give you so I've had a few obviously people um, flying about trying to cause me problems Violence wise, um, I had three people offered money to cut me when I was in prison. Contracts on me recently. Well, that got put to bed very quickly. Um, so, stuff like that. Um, other than that, it's, it's, Roger Vincent is. So, I, when I. I got shot years ago, and the gentleman that shot me, he handed himself into the police and had the gun as well. I, I was told that he gave him the gun after he handed himself in, because he knew the police were looking for him. So I've got to get the details a little bit more clear on that. But he handed himself into police, and the book has brought out problems where people say that I gave evidence against him. Now, what I did do, and I'm going to give a podcast with looking to get these people on the podcast with me because one, he handed himself into the police. I got arrested myself by the police. I left the scene, went, didn't know the kid, kid did nothing wrong to me. He was just, he had already done a few things and he let the gun off and shot me. He pulled a gun out of me and I said, what are you going to do with that? He said, I'm going to kill you. I'm going then. And he shot me. I, I called his bluff, he shot me. Right? Where did he shoot you? In the head, I got uh, shotgun pellets in my head. So I went home, put cotton buds, cotton buds in my head, cut them off. Could big holes at the time. Then went back out looking for him. And uh, the long and short of the story is so I got shot. Um, I was going to do a podcast because I got reminded for a kidnapping. He started writing to me in prison on prison letters. So they recorded in the system saying, yeah. I didn't know it was you I shot. Can't one of, we didn't, can't we sort this out? He's already threw himself in. He didn't give a monkey. So he was very, very wild himself. Um, Come to court, I then go to court. I got warrant, uh, judge issued on my arrest, subpoenaed me. I was going to get banged up for a while. So I got to court about half 11. The kid's sitting in the dock doing this to me. I said, I'll fucking punch your head and keep doing that to me. No, no, he's already hung himself anyway in his yeah. letters and that, you know. So I was told to get in the dock, got in the dock, I said, I can't, I don't know anything. That geezer was not there when I got shot. I can't do nothing about him can't help him, he fucking handed himself into the police, you know? Yeah, yeah. And he's already written letters saying it. So the book's brought out where people say, I gave evidence, but I'm going to rectify that because I know what went on. They know what went on. You know, and it's only just come out now as a result of the book. All these years later. So it's a bit of people at the mix, you with me? Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to get that rectified. And that's it really. But in anything, it's probably a positive because I will get it, same with the paperwork. People saying, I've made all the paperwork up. People have got nothing back to do than lie. So you just bat them off. But even if you did say something, you got shot in the head. Ah, I'm not, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. I'm not, you know, I got the other kid who, who was there actually when I got shot. I'm not guilty. <laughs> well, I believe he was there. I want to be careful what I say now. But I did say, no, he weren't there. Well, I couldn't eat the other fella. Mm. So the book's brought a bit of publicity out about that. So I'm looking to do and that's called like a table with Kevin Lane. And if anybody else now goes and does a table where what I'm looking, I'm not going to, I'm going to be in a restaurant and we get the cameras set up and there'll be Kenny Collins there and various other people, friends of mine, good talkers, nice characters to be around, having a, bit, having a nice meal. I think that'd be chat. pretty epic. And uh, so you'll hear some stories that have gone on and I'd like to get them to there about the evening. So, you know, I, mean, I fucking got shot by you. And I'll just talk about the court case and they can see it being reenacted, how it happened, their side, my side, yeah. but in a nice manner. No aggressiveness to it. Shake your hands, have a drink and a yeah, meal. Yeah. Like, can we move on now? I've got kids, you've probably got kids. Yeah. I'm not interested in that. Mm. They may not be interested, of course. But that's what the They'll probably think they're getting fitted out when they uh, fitted up, put in the boot. <laughs> 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 but the the upside of the book brought a bit of trouble that way. But now the positive of that, I want to go forward and do something about it. Yeah. And it puts it to bed. Yeah. And then so How long did he get? 
He got seven years. He was offered a, a mental institution because he was a bit scatty at the time. Not, well, not mental, but he said, look, yeah, he'd well, done something. This is it. And he said, no, I'm not going to fucking mental institution. And he went not guilty. And he got a guilty. The prison officers give evidence against him for stuff that had gone on in the prison, apparently, uh, and stuff like that, you know. He got seven years and he got out and got on with his life, you know, he's... That's what he does now. I ain't seen him, but I've, it's been on my mind to go and find him, and uh, more so now. So that is really the only couple of things that have come to light. The contracts on me when I was in prison, that's all right. They got, like I say, put to bed. Um, and that. So uh, the positives are that the amount of people that are reading it and getting the information out that... It's in the public domain. I mean, my best mate, Marcus Lemaire, he's in the book. He's read the book. He's read the manuscript of it when I first wrote it. Oh, wow. And last night, no, not last night, the weekend, I gave him a hard copy. He still hadn't had one a year later. Oh, really? Right? He won't buy one to tight get. <laughs> so I gave him a book, wrote something in it. Um, he was drinking that night. He said, Kevin, I've read 40 pages and I'll get, and I'll, I can't put it down. That's my own best mate. So the red first 40 pages that evening. So the, I'm really pleased with that. It's getting to people, touching people that I might, I might not have ordinarily have touched. Yeah. And, and I think that, I think, you know, like when, when you're laying yourself out there, um, people are curious. And then, um, when, when they read your book or they listen to a podcast it absorbs them to a point where they're like, wow, this guy is like a, is like a real film. Is that film? Film or film? The film. <laughs> it's a real film. He is. <laughs> In the name of the father, Paul. Three million pound budget, I think it was. Or, or something like that. Look at it. Oscar winning. And, you know, true story. Yeah. Made by the Irish. It's a good film. It's a good film. Good film. Brilliant <laughs> film. And then it, you've got Ray Burgess talking about it. I met with, uh, uh, I'm going to be meeting with Ray in relation to setting up a production company and Paul Ferris are talking about it in a minute. But uh, Leon F. Butler, he works with Idris Elba. Uh, and He's a good villain, he is. Yeah, he's just, a good villain. He just, so, yeah, he just plays a very good villain, I think. But Leon's been following my, my story for years in relation to a film. And there's, there's, there's other people I'm talking to, but it may never happen. But mm. the ingredients of that book make an excellent film. Yeah, 100%. Excellent film. So who knows where it'll go? It may not. But the fact is, the book is being well received by people. And I'm finally getting my story out there. And they can go on change.org and sign a petition to have my case referred to the, uh, or a parliamentary investigation. Or you can go to the Panorama program, which is on Fitted Up and Fighting Back website. Last Chance for Justice by, by Mark Daly. That clearly shows I sh I've been found guilty. The jury were told I gripped a gun inside a bag and the inside that bag was live ammunition or spent gun. And that my print on that bag is consistent with gripping a Mossberg pump action shotgun. Now the prosecution told the jury that the, the, the deceased was killed with a Mossberg pump action. So as far as the jury is concerned, I've gripped a gun in that bag. Yeah. Damning evidence. Tracy Alexander for City Westminster Police conducted an ex uh, forensic tests with uh, some other uh, forensic experts. And they've turned around and said, what a load of rubbish. It should never have been said. Absolute garbage. It could have been a box of cornflakes. There was one particle of forensic residue in that bag. Every one in 90 people on the train is contaminated with forensic residue really? in London, yes. If there had been a gun in there or ammunition, there would be hundreds of particles in there, especially if the gun had been used. Yeah. It wouldn't have been one particle. And the jury was told that I'd had a gun in there and I'd gripped it. That was damning for me. So I'm now due to go to the Criminal Cases Review Commission for the fourth time, based on the Panorama programme. And that you can't second guess what a jury member would have made of any particular part of evidence. And it's the point of law called Pendleton. You cannot second guess what you would have thought of it, positive or negative. And on that basis alone, my conviction's unsafe. Without the police officer, 
visiting Vincent after the, the, the crime and Vincent gets acquitted and the copper goes around to his house twice on his own and gets invited in. Stuff like that. They didn't go to the, where Vincent worked, the Ministry of Justice, apparently he was in there. Cameras would have showed him going in there. Didn't do that till six months after. All the evidence that was suppressed to make sure Vincent walked and I took the fall. All this stuff is in the book. Okay, now the Panorama program has brought to light forensic issues that I was convicted on. And watch it. Last chance for justice on the fitted up and fighting back. Guaranteed you'll go, blimey, is that what they've done to him again? Do you, do, do you feel like um, that it's going to get to a point where, like, all of this is going to... Do you feel like there is an end to this where they're going to say, do you know what? We stand here today and say that all the evidence was falsified against you um, and you uh, didn't do any of it. Gavin, you are free. I do believe that because it's, you cannot argue with facts. And the, fact, the facts are now in the public domain. Mm -hmm. And it's not that... Uh, Kenny said to me the other day, Kenny, he says, Kenny Collins, he says, you know, he's finally got a copy of the book. He's in there, okay? So he said, Kevin, he said, it's so well written. And he, he, you keep you interested. You want to know what's on the back page. He said, not because I'm a criminal, because it's all so much different. He knows my case, but my best mate, like I say, first 40 pages, couldn't put it down. Mm -hmm. I, wrote, I wrote it in the manner of Christian Tarantino. So you're... You're stepping in, you're stepping yeah, out, yeah. you're stepping in, you're stepping out. Yeah. And in that manner, it keeps it bubbling away. Mm -hmm. You think, fuck me, oh yeah, and you go back to that and you come out. And, and I've had people who have trouble reading. I've had travellers who have trouble, who can't read. People have learning difficulties reading it. And they've said, Kevin, my God. So I know this book is great. So, um, I forget what my point I was making now about it, but what was we making about it? So, in terms of the book and where it will go, I don't know, but it's, so it's doing about, really well. It's about you being um, free oh, quick, from, yeah. your, so people from your read life, the book. From your life sentence. That's it, yeah. It's a great book. It's a great read. And Have you had any judges or barristers like pick this and go, Yes, I had a I'm going gonna, gonna to fight your corner here? I had a judge read it. Yeah. Okay, I can't mention his name either. And he was a physiotherapist for the Wales squad. Give it to him. And he said it's excellent. Uh, I, did, I did a speech at uh, Cambridge University and I did the prestigious Law Society in Marnebone and I've done other speeches as well, guest appearances and that. Uh, and I had a law lord come up to me, shake my hand. Tom Conte, the uh, actor. Yeah. Uh, I must shake this young man's hand, he said. And you know what's the other one? Not catch me if you can. He was a copper, but he ran a series where he got evaded being caught for a number of days. Um, uh, Do you know what I mean? You saw Hunted. Hunted. Yeah, that was it. He come and spoke to me, you know, and he does crime programmes now. And So, yeah, again, I think the, the the book is really opening up doors now because I can sit here and talk to you about this, that, this, that, and this, that. But when you read it and you take it in or you're reading it, it's different to being told stuff. And I find that once people have read the book, it goes, what an absolute fucking liberty has been taken with you. And you've been fitted up right away from the start, fitted up. Not just by me whinging or crying about this or crying about that, saying, fact, 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 fact. What can you say about fact? You can't argue. No, and I think with this, because it, like the evidence is there for the public domain to be seen, the police can't stop this from going out. They can't, no. They can't stop it from going out. And I think I think you knew that you had to be that way when you writ the book because you I think you knew that if you would have writ one of the world's best crime books, that they would have done everything they can to stop that from coming Shut it out. Down. So in the name of the father, it was all truth. Oscar winners like we say. Stick to the truth. That's all you got. But the truth is there's several murders in there. There's all sorts of police corruption going on. Coppers going to prison. Uh, all manner of... So, for instance, I'll give you one point of... Uh, what, facts that people would not believe that go on in the criminal justice system. So, half of the police conducted a review of my murder. Didn't ever tell me about it. It's called Operation Cactus. During that review, one of the police officers... Uh, superintendent 
refused to be interviewed by his own colleagues conducting that uh, review. Really? Paid for by the police force that was paying his wages. <laughs> okay? He refused to be interviewed. And also, the police officers that were conducting that review was not given uh, access to all the paperwork in the case. Wow. How can you conduct a review of a murder, be refused to interview the superintendents and such of that case, and be denied access to all the paperwork? That's factual. Yeah. And I've got the documents to prove it. Yeah. In the book. Yeah, and that, that must have been a big, like, thumbs up for you. They must have been swearing about that. Going nuts. Mm. I wrote to the Taxpayers Alliance. I said, you pay your tax, don't you? I said, well, you've wasted your money on that operation, that review, because such and such refused to be interviewed. And the police also refused to give the review team the paperwork on that case. That's a waste of taxpayers' money. I got given a Spanish archer, the elbow, to give me nothing. Clear off, they said. Really? Didn't want to know. <laughs> and that's what I used to get all the time. But it's all in the book. And it's things like that that people will read and go, is that really? Yeah, it did take place. So when it come to the the three murders that you was um, thinking for, were they were they all like executed in the same way, or was it all like different different things, or was it that like they managed to get enough evidence on one, and because the other two were very similar, they just thought, fuck it, I'm just going to throw you in with them as well. Uh, no, I don't think they were. Um, no, they weren't. It's just the fact that Vincent told them that I committed those murders. <laughs> Well, um, it all comes back to him, doesn't it? Yeah, he told him. And up until that point, I was fine. Then he's come along, told the police about these murders. And the, in the book, this is, I've got to go back to the book, but a gentleman came forward. He said, I've been told to read your website. I've been up all night reading it. I've come home from work. I've read it all night. He's contacted my solicitor on the website. He said, I've got information about this case. He said, I bought the gun used in the murder. Yeah. Did he say who he bought it from? Yes, he did. Wow. And, and he said, I will take a lie detector test. I will face the wrath of the criminal fraternity. He said, for getting in the dock and giving evidence about what I know about this case, because an innocent man is in prison. Who do you think got, well, you're going to guess, in you? Was given the job of interviewing this man. And he lives a bloody long way away. Yeah. Half of your police. Half of your police travelled a very long way away to visit this man, interviewed him, and then threatened him with prosecution. Really? What was um, what they threatened him with? Like Averting the course of justice. Yeah. And he couldn't believe it. He said, look, I, I bought that gun because I needed a bit of protection at the time, but I bought it off of this person. And that person told me that he'd blown someone's head off with it, blah, 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 blah. And he also told me about some other murders. And he described things about them murders. They're the murders that he says that I did. I think that Roger Vincent is a complete Walter Mitten. He goes around calling himself Freddy Krueger. And if he hears that something gone on down there, he would tell people he did it. Yeah. You know, he would tell people he's chopped bodies up and buried them and stuff like that. And I've killed more people than Freddy Krueger. Creating their own fame. He creates his own fame because he's an arsehole in terms of he can't hold his hands up. Pick a gun up, Christ, you're God in the eyes of some people, mm -hmm. but a typical bully. Typical bully, you know, and so he's got to portray himself in a manner where people are frightened of him or think he's this or he's that. And he has built himself up a bit of a name amongst those people who want to be fooled by him. But let me tell you, when he was in Belmarsh Unit, he went up to the governor and in front of other inmates and said, you can't send me to Whitemore, Kevin Lane's there. You've got to keep us apart. Panic mode. Mm. Got his solicitor to write to the home office and said, you got to keep them apart. Because if he'd have come into the system with me, I'd have smashed the life out of him. Yeah. And Smith, the pair of them. I'd done them both together. No problem. Weighed them both in. But they kept it apart. I didn't sense them. They've always tried to have me weighed in. Cut, slab, stash. I've had three contracts on my life, regardless of the other three, by some people that you would not want paid to come and get you. Really? I am telling you now, you will not want them. Both of them natural lifers. One of them, David Bieber, he tried, he's just been found guilty, I think, for trying to cut a screw's head off. He shot the two police officers in Leeds. 
Oh, when he was yeah. an American, ironed him out. Dave's bleeding, dangerous. And he, and he came to the Kevin, I'm going to tell you, so I've been asked to, you know, kill you. All right, and I've been offered a lot of money for it. I'm telling you in case you find out, because I don't want any trouble. I like you, Kevin. I thought, oh, fucking hell, that's a touch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I do not want you on my case, David, I can assure you. <laughs> All right? You know, I'm fucking, listen, it's just it's, it's facts of life, isn't it? You know, people are extremely dangerous. I'm quite rather he weren't on my case. Yeah, yeah. I'll deal with it if I've got to. Yeah. You know, but you can't see a knife coming in the neck or the eye, can you? Nah. So he was one. Another geezer. He's dead now, Victor, Philippine. Always stabbing people through the system. Mental stabbing. He come up to me. Got him really well, Victor and all. He said, he come and told me. And then another geezer I can't mention. But uh, three of them offered 100 grand to uh, top me. Because Vincent didn't want all this coming out. Wow. Mm. But it just goes to show what kind of man that you are. The fact that these people are very, very dangerous. And they come to tell you, um, I, I like you. And you, I've been offered this to, to offer you. You know, that just goes to show what kind of guy you, you, you are. Um, I, do you know, Paul, I get a bit embarrassed about it. But I'm humbled in the manner that... One, they like me, mm -hmm. decent fella. I think I'm a decent fella. You know? oh, oh, yeah, I believe that too. I've made mistakes in my life. I've learned from man? them. You Who know? hasn't? And I, you know, I just, uh, I know I'm kind and I'm caring. I'm a stubborn bastard, but I know I'm kind and caring. And I think the better of people rather than the worst. But yeah, I was well liked in prison. You always can't, you, some people just won't like because you can't get on. Mm -hmm. That's just human nature. But I know I was well liked in prison. I used to get 250 to 300 Christmas cards a year. Screws come up and say, Kevin, you get more cards than Charlie Bronson. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd send them all myself. That's why I've got them yeah. stamps in here. Yeah, all <laughs> stamps. Oh, I've, I've Return all the sender. <laughs> Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I'm, I'm humbled by that. But I walked them bloody landings, okay? I went into any prison on my own. I walked onto them landings on my own. And I went in there on my own, and I came out on my own. I come into this world on my own, I'll be going out of it on my own. Mm -hmm. all right? And I say to people, we all bleed. Mm -hmm. all right? Simple as that. The reputation that's put around you, forget that. We're human beings. Yeah. Why does it have to come to that? Mm -hmm. Why can't it come to, you know... Hold on, no, man. I agree with you. you know, fucking, why does violence have to be the be-all and end-all? And I... Look, I started working the doors when I was 18. Because I didn't want to go to places where my mates are going to get drunk, like young kids do. Not all young kids, but they're fighting. Yeah. I thought, that don't entertain me. Yeah. I'll go and get paid to fight on the door. Yeah. But we're here to attract, restrain people. Yeah. To look after our customers, not beat them up. Mm -hmm. So it's a different mindset again. Yeah, yeah. And I did very well in the security industry. And I was asked to go and work places I weren't old enough to be in. <laughs> people thought I was a manager. Oh, really? So I could come up and say, hello, what's the problem? <laughs> And they go, you're fucking dormant. <laughs> <laughs> they want me to leave because they said I'm pissed. <laughs> Just go and talk by the door or I can hear you. Door's open now, you've got to go home. Yeah, yeah you've got to go. Time you go. <laughs> but finish your beer before you do. Yeah, yeah. You know, not pull it out of their hand and all yeah. that. Old, you know, so, yeah, so I would work and I had less problems on the door for however long it was. Then I know that my pals are going out on their day. That someone would pinch their bird's ass or, you know, I mean, getting yeah. drunk as they are at 18. I didn't do none of that. I don't agree with violence. I might be, well, I was all right at it. I could hold my hands up as a young kid. But uh, last resort for me, and uh, I'm proud of the man I am today, mm -hmm. uh, and I sleep well at night. Sometimes I feel like I'm being interfered with. <laughs> I thought, oh, who's in bed, mate? I'm used to being in bed on my own for 20 years, <laughs> isn't I? <laughs> oh, oh, who's that? Oh, fuck me, I'm not on my own. How do you manage a relationship um, with being alone for 20 years and then coming out and having to share a bed? Like, how, how did that work out for you? Well, you need a big bed. Yeah. You're used to sleeping on a bed where you turn on the spot. Yeah. You don't roll over. Mm -hmm. So, no, it's bloody... Depends how much they fart or snore, doesn't it, really? <laughs> right? Or how they move their legs or their elbows and that. Yeah. But I have pretty good sleep in me. I wake up when it goes on, but I sleep well. Yeah. I don't know. I came home from prison and got straight back on with my life. Bang. I had a problem with Bluetooth, all them, banking, difficulty. I wasn't good with that. I think that's because you kept your mind active in, in your case. 
I think that's why you, you've managed to be able to come out and, and progress the two businesses that you did. Um, you know, damn COVID, but like, you know, you've, you've managed to be able to come out and, and, and be a success rather than struggle to be living normality, you know, um, because it is very different outside to inside. Paul, it is amazingly different here, but you've got to have a thirst for life. You've got to want to succeed and have the energy. Just get up mm -hmm. and go to work and have that drive to make something succeed. So I've been home now two months from this bloody recall mm -hmm. that I've done. So in the two months I've been home, I've got a share in a racehorse. <laughs> <laughs> I feel I own the leg, right? <laughs> or the back arse of it. I have the rump. I own the yeah, rump, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I've been porting houses from abroad. That you, th th this country. I've been showing people them. They're beautiful homes. The German ones and that lot. German, yeah. but I, I, they shut down a bit. So I'm bringing houses in from Turkey. Yeah. And I'm, I'm contracted to these houses, and you can raise money for self builds. They're still frame. Yeah. Solid walls, not stud walls. Solid yeah. wall homes, underfloor heating, marble kitchens, marble. It's an excellent homes. Okay. For money you could not believe. So if you go on modulehomes.co.uk you'll start seeing them on there. Garden log sheds and stuff like that. So in the two months I've been home, I'm going to be importing some homes. And I'll be getting them homes sold on Module Homes UK. Okay? I've got some shares in some lorries, two lorries that are out crafting at the minute, uh, an interest in them. A couple of little vans are out working at the moment. And I'm out there, business development, bringing in work mm. or finding contracts for these these lorries and these vans in two months. And I'm getting a, a wage, okay? Mm -hmm. I'll bring home about two grand a week. And I don't mind, I don't, it's not the best of money. It's okay? good. It gets me through. So in two months, I've generated just under £2,000 a week. I have a lot of bills to pay. I've got uh, maintenance to pay and uh, uh, school fees and my even fees, I've got to get back on my feet. Um, sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down. But I aim to have, I pick a figure, I aim to be on, hopefully, and I may not, I may get there, but I will certainly be somewhere bleeding near it or doing okay unless things go drastically wrong for me. I need to be on about £100,000 a month, 25 grand a week. And I'll tell you why I need to be on that, because I've got lots of people I need to take care of mm. who aren't in such a fortunate position as me. And I've got lots of things I want to do with my money when I get it. And I spend it willy-nilly now for whatever reasons. Yeah. And it ain't all on me, I can assure you. Mm -hmm. So I do. I work with Nishcam Swap, dealing, dishing out food to the homeless. Okay, I've got my own hub. I like and I like those sort of things. Yeah. I, and I get, I see a kid yesterday, I'll give him 45 quid. 18-year-old boy, chatting away to him. I say, yeah, and he's watched my podcast. He said, oh, honestly, he said, all your reviews, he said, what people are saying, he said, about you, Kevin. And I said, look, I said, that's nice. And I said, look, how you doing for money anyway? I said, you already said these nice things, so I won't buy any, was I? <laughs> <laughs> I said, you always need money as a young kid. I said, just take my life. I had uh, 45 quid in there and I had some 50s. I'm not going to give him a 50. Yeah. I should have done really, but I like keeping the 50s. <laughs> so I gave him the 45 quid. I said, go on, you and your girlfriend, you need to. I didn't know if he had a girlfriend. I said, but you always need money in your pocket. And I went off. And today I will send some money into prison to someone and I will do it to someone else and someone else. So you may sound like a lot of money, £2,000 a week, but if you do £200 a week on fuel, maybe £300, you do X amount of maintenance a month and rent and food and... You know, soon goes. Soon so we live done. in an expensive yeah. world. Expensive world, bleeding. Might have a bit of Botox. <laughs> <laughs> really good for migraines. What Botox? Mm -hmm. Is it? Yeah, really good. I have, I have it for migraines. I don't get it. Yeah. Now I've, I've, I've suffered migraines since I was very, very young, and I have to. I, I have it done for for migraines. Well, tell me this, right? You're getting your hair cut in a barber's. <laughs> then take the piss. No. <laughs> <laughs> but you get the snow when you did. You only put the shears on your back of your neck. Yeah. It makes you guys think, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. I've always thought for people with migraines, if they could have a machine that could do that to them, yeah, 
Never thought about that. Next time you get a mile going, try it. I think. So honestly, since I've had uh, since I've, I've had the Botox, I don't get headaches. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, it's absolutely absolutely amazing. Uh, it really really does work. I've, I, you know, I've, I've tried many many things. I've had uh, I have to have injections and stuff from doctors and stuff to um, uh, help with my migraines. And uh, when I get it, I go photophobic, so I go completely blind. And uh, yeah, and it's fast as well. Like I'm talking from first symptom to to being teetotal, laid out in bed covers over since i since i have the botox i have it every sort of uh 10 10 weeks i think it is 10 it weeks looks so and, much younger well you know <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it's, it completely stops it completely stops it don't have migraines i've got my left buttock is larger than my right buttock yeah <laughs> <laughs> they put too much botox in it's <laughs> probably why i got a massive forehead <laughs> they're doing buttocks botox aren't they all yeah they oh, do they, but you can God. put it in if you if you sweat too much as well you can have it done i've got that done because you know some place you do sweat when you've got a shirt on or you know just just in, just in general i think nowadays the pressures of the world that creates um expression anyways you know so but yeah you can have it but the problem is if you if you sweat, say like if you've got like a sweaty lip or a sweaty face, girls get it a lot, you know, sweaty lip. Um, you can you can put Botox in there, stop it from sweating. The problem is it's got to come out somewhere else, isn't it? Yeah, normally out of arse. <laughs> <laughs> no offence, young ladies. She's got a Botox, got it. So, you yeah. have a bit of Botox? Yeah. Yeah, no problem, all right? And it's all real gear. It ain't snide either from China. Yeah. <laughs> Injecting that concrete. <laughs> <laughs> Look at them bloody eggs they do. Yeah. Hey, gold. You'd eat it. No, no different, would you? Mm. Well, anyway, we digress there about it. So, any other questions you think? We no, I, think, um, I don't want to bore your viewers. No, no, no. Nah, my viewers are good, man. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're good. They're really good. I, I really appreciate everything that you've done for me today. Like you. Well, I don't know about done. It's enjoyed the conversation. It's been a mutual experience, and I've thoroughly enjoyed having a chat with you. It's not what I've done for you. It's just nice having a chat with meeting you. Yeah, I really appreciate it, man. Uh, and my viewers will really appreciate it. If I could it, ever so. do anything for any of your viewers, you know, contact you through there. Don't be frightened to mention me. I'll do speeches. I'll come to schools. I've got to go to a university. I've got to go to Derby University. They're using my book as a case study for law students. Oh, really? How about that? That's, that's absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. amazing. When, I, when I first started doing the podcast and stuff, I was doing it um, with victims and stuff. And um, they're actually using my, um, some of my podcasts that I've, I've done to help raise awareness within the college in um, education. So um, this is something that that's we've good. only recently learned over the last sort of month and a half that they've been using. Use, I thought my views were going out. so proud, does not Do you know what it is? Uh, I, I don't understand why they never contacted me and just say, like, you know, this is what we're doing. Um, I found out because after, I just started getting messages saying, oh, my God, we've seen your podcast. Um, you know, it really has changed the way that I think about how I act and things like that. And I was like, what? What? what, what are brilliant. these people? So I contacted them back and I was like, I'm sorry, I, I don't know what you're talking about. And then they'd say, oh, at, at our college... They're playing your videos in, in in college to help raise awareness. And it blew my mind. I absolutely was like, wow. And it just, it all adds to the reason why I do the podcast, you know. It's just raising that awareness. And, mm. uh, you know, crime, crime really doesn't pay. Um, and as much as you want to be the biggest and the baddest out there, when you become of age where you're a lot wiser and you're a lot knowledgeable. You you do regret the things that you have done in the past, and you do apolog You do make apologies to do these certain things, and the change is great because, like for you, you are fitted up. So the change that you're doing, the awareness that you're creating, is great for for people because you don't have to have done the crime to have been fitted up like yeah. a criminal, and lives are being turned over. In, in this in this fraternity of like mm. I need to be the biggest and the baddest ain't no one gonna be like how it used to be you know like you say crime has changed, oh, it's changed and if you if you was to relive it all again and be a criminal today you wouldn't do it oh bleeding hell do you know what throw stones at low flying airplanes or punch waves in the sea it's a lot better crime to do Right, yeah. you won't get Nick doing it. Yeah. Kids, you know, kids should be taught to do mischievous things like that. We've all found stones at low flying airplanes. Mm -hmm. You're never going to hit them, are you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You never know. I've got a good arm on me. You know, kids should be taught to, you know, 
just not not the thing. The, it's the, the knives and the can I, tell me why do we sell the knives that we sell for kids to get our hands on? The Bowie oh. knives, the fucking Rambo knives, the zombie ones, the zombie ones, the flick knives. All why are they made and why are they sold? For what use are any of those weapons used for? Outside of killing and, or hurting someone. And the thing is, these knives are turning up pretty sharp. They're sharp. They're not even... Do you know when you used to be able to buy a samurai sword and they weren't sharp? You just have it on the wall. Do you I know what I mean? I've never bought one. You talk to yourself about that one. <laughs> <laughs> but these are turning up quite ready to go. Ready to go and f commit murder. They should all be barred. They should be barred for manufacture. Yep. They should be banned, should I say. And they should be banned for being imported or made in this country. 100%. Because what are they used for other than causing... We we done injuries we done a death. we done a thing because um, I do a lot of round knife crime. I lost my brother. He was he was murdered um, through knife crime, and I do Put a lot knives of... down save lives. Yeah, I have yeah. that. I do work with that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, ben Span. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. a good guy. Good, yeah. uh, he's a good friend of mine. Yeah, yeah. Ben, good pair yeah, play too. Yeah. And um, he, um, yeah, we, we decided to, to, to go on the internet to see how easy it was to buy um, credit card knives, um, comb knives, you know, all things that you are able to get in schools, to take into school without being... Crazy. Okay. My God, right? We, we, bought, we bought two credit card knives, comb knife. Um, we got set, it was several different knives. It, it come to less than a tenner. It come to less than ten pound. Um, I ordered it, put the card details in, that turned up about two weeks later through the letterbox, through the post, and these were knives ready to go, take into schools and go. What has it got to take? Has it got to take a uh, member of the royal family or a politician's son or daughter to get well, we, killed? Well, we, 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 we went through all of this. We, we literally went through all of this. Like, what is it going to take? And, you know, we've, we've got, we've been up against the mayor. We've been, um, we've been to the House of Parliaments with it as well. And we, we've done all of the above. And, and <laughs> one, of the, the, one of the people um, that had, could do something about things turned around and said, look, you know, it's just crackheads killing crackheads. And this is, this is high power. There's just crackheads killing crackheads. And um, also they turn around and says, well, they're not going to come for the likes of us, are they? You know, and she's like, you know, lardy da suited and booted. And she's like, they're not going to come. They're going to be more like, and then she's trying to say, because I was wearing shorts and the t-shirt more, she was trying to say more like for me. Yeah. yeah? But I was there doing, doing stuff to stop it was prevention do you know what I mean so like I, uh, I turned around and said to her I said that's really funny you should say that I said because one of the richest men in the UK was stabbed in his house and died um, about three months ago by his own son yeah. you know um, you, you don't hear that on the council estate you know and she was like oh really like oh uh, yeah, yeah it was, it's, it's hard work it's hard work but we ain't, we ain't stopping we're still we're still progressing we're still pushing forward for that yeah I'm, I'm always going to uh promote the abolishment of them. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm going to promote. And it really does need that. And I'm hoping one day to get my charity up and running where I, I want to do something for... Uh, in to do with sport, but I will go in and uh, take women and men to do some training or go to wherever they are, in whatever hostels they're in or any refuge they're at, to give them a way out. And I think sport is a way forward. It's a different, the happy hormone. Yeah. If you can just pump something back into him instead of drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I'm aiming for. And again, whilst you're doing your own little bits and pieces, you have always think of other areas where you say, well, I don't agree with gun crime. I don't, I don't agree with fucking knife crime. And, mm -hmm. you know, and, and nunchuckers, unless it's a sport, okay, but star with David being flung around the bleeding, giving to kids. There's, there's always going to be an, uh, a revenue for you to go down to help make a change. The problem is you can't spread yourself out. You, you spread yourself so thin that your attention's not focused on, on one of the areas. Do you, do you know what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah. Um, for me, yeah, I'd always done charity work. I've always done stuff for the community. I've always, I've always been, I took so much away when I was younger that, um, you know, it was my time to give back. And for that, I started doing a lot. And it wasn't until um, 
that my brother was murdered. He was one of the most powerful guys that I've ever known, and he was murdered. Just one, he just got stabbed once, wrong place, wrong time, um, mistaken identity as such, and it? um, I'd, I'd lost him, and that completely changed everything for the way that I that. think. Oh, yeah, sad. yeah, yeah. Is 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 sad. It's sad, but I've put. I've put his legacy to use. I've not let him die for no reason, you know. With the change that we're making within the community is so massive that it got recognised by um, Martin Murray, the pro boxer. Yeah. Um, he's got an academy and he's um, we're part of that yeah, academy. Yeah, I've heard of that, well. yeah. Yeah, Think Fast. Yeah, I've heard of him. And yeah, they're... and do you know what? He's got a hell of a story. His podcast is coming out soon and uh, he's, his story is from the dire streets to... I know it is. Yeah. Yeah, and in, in, in Manchester, where's uh, Warrington? Warrington, yeah, yeah, out that way. Yeah. I've had some boxing gloves off from when I was away before. Uh, I think they're signed and that, yeah, and stuff. But yeah, I've heard a bit about his story. Yeah, yeah. He's, it's, a, it's a hell of a. He's um, he gave us the exclusive, um, never been told. And, Good, um, yeah. what a story. Oh, do you know what it is? Uh, we bumped into him at a charity event in Wales um, for another charity event. We was up there doing our thing and. Um, he was there and we just gelled straight yeah. away. And uh, yeah, what a guy. I'm hoping that Tony Bellew's going to do a bit. I've just given him a, 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 my book to his best mate to have a read off. But the boxers can bring a lot of recognition mm -hmm. to fitting up and fighting back, knife crime and such, because mm -hmm. they've got a large following. Yeah, definitely. And so you've got to use your avenues. They're safe through sport, don't they? Yeah. To try and bring. To I think, it can put, I think it can pull people together. And, and you know, you need help at all in any, any way whatsoever when it comes to you setting this up. I'm happy to jump on board yeah, with you. Paul. I want about doing uh, Naked Chef. <laughs> <laughs> Is it going to be cold? And you're, my first, you're going to be one of the chefs <laughs> in a warm environment. <laughs> oh, good. Warm environment. Oh, good. Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We've got the chopper. <laughs> Well, right, anyway, listen, Paul, it's been an absolute No, thank you very much. Thank I you. really thank appreciate you it. You're an absolute...